recognition of guests. <coughs> the Honorable Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise in the House today. Uh, I'd like to uh, recognize that today, March 31st, is the Transgender Day of Visibility. It is a day to recognize and celebrate transgender islanders in all and all the battles that they face. Uh, with more visibility, Mr. Speaker, comes more understanding. So. Uh, Holland College culinary student Jillian Clark has won a Senior Women's Academic Administrators Award for Student Leadership. It is awarded to a student who showcases leadership in the college while attending a high academic status. Congratulations to Dr. Jillian Clark, who also holds a PhD in chemistry and will accept the national award at an annual conference hosted virtually by Memorial University at the end of April. And Mr. Speaker, uh, I guess just a sign of, of the times and where we're at, but on my drive into to, to Charlottetown today, there were two businesses with signs posted looking for, for workers. One of them is the, the new barbecue place at uh, the Chuck Wagon Corn Maze. Uh, I, I believe it's Pappy's Barbecue. They're looking for, for help. Kira McLeod is looking for help. And before I came down here, the Gillis Lodge is looking for a cleaner. So it just shows you how much work is out there and how concerning it is that we do not have workers to fill all jobs. Uh, so I think it's just really interesting. I, I can't remember a time where you saw so many help wanted signs posted on PEI. And Mr. Speaker, um, lastly, I'd just like to send get well wishes to our Premier. He does have COVID. He is uh, at home, not feeling very well, but uh, we'll, we, I'm sure everyone here in the Assembly sends him our very best, and we wish him back here very soon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I too would like to wish our, our Premier a speedy recovery. I hope he has nothing more than a mild case and that he, ha he has a complete and, and quick recovery. I would also like to, uh, like to welcome, I think it's John Tara underneath that mask. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, welcome to the gallery. Nice to see you. Um, and today, of course, is a Trans Day of, of Visibility, and it's a day where we celebrate the beauty and the, and the resilience of transgender and non-binary people and islanders and folks everywhere who live uh, as their true selves, um, openly and authentically. And I wish it weren't so, but that requires a certain amount of courage to do that. And I uh, particularly want to point out a couple of islanders, non-binary gender fluid islanders, who have an exhibition which is opening today at the uh, Georgetown, the King's Playhouse in Georgetown. Um, I would like to congratulate Julie Bull and Rory Starkman on their exhibition, which opens there today. And it's called The Gender Reveal Party. And it challenges, challenges us all to think about um, those binary conventions, and of course it's not your conventional uh, gender reveal party indeed, it's saying let's think about what we're doing here um, and, and to think more deeply about what gender is and, and what our understanding of that is and how limiting that can be for a significant number of people in our community. And as Julie Bull says, and I quote, I quote them, the point is that the art is our experiences as non-binary, gender-fluid people. The art includes all kinds of emotions. It's joyful, it's painful, it's loss, it's all of it. It's all of the art and all of the feelings put together. So again, congratulations to Julie and Rory on, on putting that exhibition together and for the work that they are doing. <clears throat> Another exhibition which opens today and uh, will be in place until April the 4th is called Riverworks, and that's an exhibition that takes place at Beaconsfield Carriage House. And last summer, um, Riverworks invited three artists, three visual artists, Alexis Bowman, Doug Dumay, and Kirsty McCollum, to uh, explore the art that they were inspired to do uh, whilst on the banks of the Hillsborough River. And they created um, all kinds of interesting things from that experience. And they're going to share that work um, at the Beaconsfield Carriage House, as I say, in a, in a an exhibition that opens today, and the, the quote from the press release says, using art as a form of citizen science, these three have come together in this exhibition to expand on the themes of adapting with, listening to, and observing waterways within the larger context of the climate crisis. I haven't seen any of the works, but I'm really looking forward to dropping into Beaconsfield and seeing that. And on Saturday, April the 2nd, again at Beaconsfield at 7 p.m., there'll be a film preview 
uh, of the screening uh, director, Eliza Knockwood. Many of us would know Eliza, and a wonderful island indigenous filmmaker. And she has a film in progress currently, and it's called Rite of Passage, and it's, uh, it will be previewed and premiered um, at, that, at that exhibition on Saturday the 2nd. And finally, speaker, tonight the PEI Certified Organic Producers Co-op is holding their AGM at 7 o'clock um, at 159 Sherwood Road here in Charlottetown, or you can join online. A fantastic organization doing a lot of work to promote the burgeoning field of organic agriculture. Uh, with great support, I might add, from the department here um, in a variety of ways to make that happen. So congratulations to their president, Brian McKay, McKay um, and their staff member and agronomist, Karen Murchison, who is a real font of knowledge on soil health. And I believe that Judy Lowe will be giving an update to tonight at the AGM on ACORN, which is another fantastic organization promoting diversity and organic agriculture here in, in this region. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from O'Leary Inverness, third party with. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I guess I get the chance to fill in for our leader at the moment here on this particular issue, but I, I too also want to wish the Premier get well uh, quick, and uh, I would sort of say it's not quite the same in here. He's, he's certainly a worthy adversary when it comes to a good story or a quip, and I try to set the bar as high as I can, try to reach where he's at, but we'll get there eventually. Uh, I also want to thank or welcome the people from O'Leary Inverness who have a chance to be watching here today. And I had the chance today to go over to uh, the uh, PEI Potato Expo, Mr. Speaker, and I'm always amazed at the ability of Islanders and the technology that's out there in our potato industry, Mr. Speaker. And obviously one of the first uh, booths that I wanted to get to was the HF Stewart booth uh, from the ride in Valeri Inverness and to look over some of their bin pilers and uh, some of their uh, truck boxes and things of that nature. And, uh, and also to took a look at uh, Donnie Allen's uh, new design potato harvester <laughs> what a yeah. what a specimen that is uh, and but that's technology that's uh, right here in Prince Edward Island then at the uh, I believe that one was going to Manitoba, actually, the one big fancy one that they had there, but it just shows where our exports are heading. And I also want to talk to a number of constituents there, and I know Green Diamond, Lowell Webb was one of the uh, uh, salesmen there, and just to show off some of the John Deere tractors, and it's pretty amazing. But while I was there talking to a number of farmers and one, one of the issues that was brought up, and it sort of recognizes John Tara here, but John is a big advocate for uh, uh, the Maritime Electric and the whole system of power systems that we have in the province here. And and uh, once again, I was talking to uh, HF Stewart's. The issue out there is three-phase power, Mr. Speaker. How are we going to get three-phase power out to that community? Because uh, that business really would take quite advantage of that. But it's also a case of, uh, you know, if there's a lot of tourists and visitors coming to, say, Cedar Dunes Park, West Point Lighthouse, can we even get the power out there to uh, uh, charge all those, uh, those electric vehicles? So I think those are some things that uh, we in Prince Royal need to make sure that our infrastructure is going to be a place to handle that. And uh, finally, and it's not that I don't want to, I, I don't uh, have some pleasure in trying to get ahead of the member from Mermaid Stratford, but I did get a call today again from uh, Island EMS at, at 11.30 a.m. today. There were no ambulances available on PEI and there were calls pending, but maybe the Mermaid, Mermaid Stratford can confirm that when she has her chance. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and hello to, to all my colleagues and everybody tuning in from around the island. Uh, Mr. Speaker, today, as has been mentioned, is Transgender uh, Day of Visibility, and I would like to congratulate um, the PEI Transgender Network for achieving the status of nonprofit. And Ali Inman is the, pro is the nonprofit's very first executive director, and Andy Glyden is the chair and uh, is working very busy today with Music PEI with the opening of the Canadian uh, Folk Music Awards, and I'm hoping to make it to the show this evening. And Mr. Speaker, this morning, as you know, I do breakfast program on Thursday mornings at Birchwood Intermediate, and I walked into the cafeteria after I was finished and there was a massive, massive something on the floor, which I went over and talked to Jack Headley at the Department of Education and Rebecca Dawson, who's a pre-service teacher at UPEI, and it is an indigenous map. And so for the International Indigenous 
Languages Day of, sorry, I botched that, International Indigenous Languages Day, um, they are looking at place names and how they've changed, how you know the, the English names have replaced the indigenous, indigenous names. And so they're looking at um, how geographical significance, the names represent something physical about that area or um, what the area is known for. And so a huge thank you to um, to uh, Jack Headley and Rebecca Don Dawson for doing that. And I know they're rolling that out in various parts of the island. I think that's such an amazing opportunity. They're designing tons of, le of lessons around that. I think it's very exciting. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty, and the Third Party House Leader. Oh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. Just want to say hello to everybody watching from uh, District 14, Charlottetown, West Royalty, and, and I too want to echo the statements of other members uh, about it being the uh, Transgender Day of Visibility. And, and you know, in this role, you, you get to learn and talk to a lot of pe uh, a lot of people. And and what I came to realize is that transgender people face uh, an inordinary amount of violence. So. For this to be the day of visibility is very, very important for them to, to come on out and, and you have uh, my full support and I've enjoyed listening and learning and being part of that discussion. Um, just want to say too, and, and uh, the Deputy Premier did mention it too, the UPI Panthers are playing in Nationals today. Um, it's on right now, so I don't often say, hey, listen, turn off East Link out there and make sure you turn on this, this game's on CBC Gem right now. Uh, right now, so our UPI Panthers are number eight. They're playing against number one Ryerson, and they're they're down only a couple buckets at this time. And also want to say the 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 coach for the Rams, the Ryerson Rams, is Carly Clark, who who started her coaching career here right at UPI and built the program. So looking back 10 or 15 years, uh, Carly's coaching the opposing team and has UPI playing. So congratulations to uh, both those teams, regardless of the how it turns out. Also, I want to say hello to. Um, my friend and when I was a coach at UPI way back when um, there's certain players and special players that you see come along the way and one of them is is here with us today constable Peter stay is the constable uh, watching over us today and, and he was one of the best teammates uh, that I've ever seen play and one of the best players at UPI so thanks for coming in today and thank you mr. speaker Honourable member from Mermaid Stratford and the opposition house leader Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I'd like to just give a shout out to um, all the paramedics that I know are tuning in today. They've been tuning in daily. Um, and I'd like to give a, a special shout out to all of the primary care paramedics. Um, they are really the ones that are holding our whole system together. They are um, some of the best trained paramedics in the entire country. And we can go outside of that. And really, every islander in this province is lucky to have um, those paramedics showing up whenever we need them the most. And as O'Leary and Vernes mentioned, I do have a co-critical today. Mine's for 1103. So that would be a half hour after yours, which is concerning because that just shows how long we had no ambulances available. And at 1103, we had zero ambulances available with ambulances responding from Charlottetown to calls that we're holding in West Prince. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Everybody have a great day. John member from Transport. Transportation infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's certainly a pleasure for me to rise today and uh, bring greetings to the constituents in District 6, Stratford Capic. And in particular, I'd like to wish a very happy birthday to a special young lady uh, who happens to uh, reside under my roof with me as a family member, and that would be my incredible, beautiful mother in law, Doreen McPhee. Aww. Happy birthday, Doreen. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to uh, to thank the Guardian, actually, for the story that they ran today on, on the Corrigan family. Um, I've known the Corrigans for, for uh, many, many years, pretty pretty much all of my life. Uh, they're originally from out the, in the Fort Augustus Dramore area. Um, and Joe Corrigan, who the uh, article was about, uh, passed away on March the 22nd. He was an iconic, uh, iconic figure here, um, uh, not just in Charlottetown, but on PEI. Uh, he was the owner, operator, driver of uh, City Taxi for 50 years, and uh, it's heartwarming to know that his family, um, his his uh, widow Rita, and his children, uh, his daughter Helen and, and son Joey, are going to uh, continue with this family business. And I know uh, they'll have much success uh, because Joe really put his heart and soul into this company, along with his family. So uh, we talk about transit here quite a bit in the Legislative Assembly, but we, it's important to realize that. Uh, 
the uh, taxi system here in PEI is a very important integral part of the uh, transit system as well. So all the best to uh, Rita, Helen and Joey and my condolences on Joe's passing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, welcome to online listeners from Brighton and, of course, John in the gallery. Uh, this morning, when I was reading my Guardian newspaper, along with the paper came Atlantic Business Magazine with an intriguing article called The 25 Most Powerful Women in Business. I found four PEI women had made their mark. Kathy Rose, Sherry Huang, Marty Murphy, and Margaret Wagner and I congratulate them all on their considerable achievements. I'm slightly embarrassed that I have yet to meet them personally, but I hope it will happen soon. Powerful women is what we need more of on PEI. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Land, Justice, Public Safety, and the Attorney General. Speaker, and uh, I'd like to say hello to everyone in District Beautiful District 8, uh, Stano Marshfield, and a constituent here, John Tara. Nice to see you again, John. Um, everyone knows, or most people know, I, I met with the Minister of Agriculture, uh, Mary Claude Bebo, on the weekend. And uh, in that meeting, we, we discussed about uh, the seed industry and how we have to support it. Uh, I just got a message. And she agreed that uh, they, they need the support. Uh, we have to turn that focus. So just got a message that uh, CFIA is currently meeting with the seed growers on Prince Edward Island to talk about compensation, Mr. Sport, and a path forward for our seed growers. So it's great news. We still have a lot of work to do, but uh, it's encouraging. And uh, I hope to have news on the border official date uh, any time now. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Did I miss anyone? No? Member statement. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. April 2nd has been designated by the United Nations as World Autism Awareness Day. It's to help to increase awareness and improve the quality of life for individuals with autism so that they can lead full and meaningful lives as an integral part of society and to create a more inclusive world. There are tens of millions of people living with autism all over the world, and there are dedicated community groups that work to assist and support these individuals. One such community group here in our province is the Autism Society of Prince of Rhode Island. The Autism Society of PEI plays an integral part in helping individuals and families to navigate supports and services, expand available resources, help promote awareness about autism to Islanders, and also to build towards a more supportive and inclusive community. As part of those efforts, the Autism Society of PEI is again partnering with DP Murphy Inc. on their annual World Autism Awareness Day fundraiser. Starting today, Mr. Speaker, and until Sunday, or excuse me, Sunday, April 2nd, you can visit any Tim Hortons and Wendy's location across PEI, and you can make a donation to the Autism Society of PEI. Now in its 11th year, this fundraising partnership has raised tens of thousands of dollars to support the activities of the Autism Society to support Islanders living with autism throughout the year. So if you do happen to be at a local Tim Hortons or a Wendy's over the next couple of days and you can spare a donation, I encourage all Islanders to support the Autism Society to do such valuable work here in our community. Your generosity will be greatly appreciated and you will be helping enhance the quality of life for Islanders, individuals and families living with autism. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we've established, today is Trans Day of Visibility, a time to celebrate trans and non-binary people from around the globe and acknowledge the courage it takes to live your life as your authentic self. It is also a day to acknowledge the violence, transphobia and discrimination they continue to face. Mr. Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to highlight Roots and Shoots, a program run through Peers Alliance. This program brings together parents and caregivers of transgender or gender creative kids. The program is offered in a safe, supportive, non-judgmental environment and is available to the whole family. They have discussions, gain deeper understanding and learn best practices for supporting their trans family members. They have recently partnered with Sierra's Club, Sierra Club's Wild Child Program to offer program for tra trans and gender creative children and their siblings under 14 years of age, while parents and, and 
caregivers go through roots and shoots. This program is based on the two main parts of a plant. The roots represent the parents and caregivers who are responsible for nurturing the shoots, their children or dependents, to be the best version of themselves, whatever that looks like for them. Mr. Speaker, 2SLGBTQIA plus youth are more likely to be targets of school-based bullying and harassment than their cisgender and heterosexual peers. Those with supportive families and safe schools report less severe emotional distress. I would like to thank Peers Alliance and Wild Child for the important tireless work they do to ensure PEI continues to grow into a truly accepting, nurturing, safe and healthy community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Over the last week, there's been a lot of discussion in this House on carbon pricing, and in essence, the whole debate boils down to just how much the Premier and this government is willing to invest in fighting climate change. Now, the bad news for islanders and for our island is that the answer to that question is nowhere near enough. This government says that islanders must have a choice. They can either have full carbon rebates put directly in their wallets in the amounts of hundreds of dollars, or they can have robust climate programs, but they cannot have both. The official opposition says that the climate crisis demands that we do both, and if government refuses to do both, then climate change is clearly not a priority for them. This government has no problem spending an extra $17 million on paving a couple of years ago, and yet it balks the moment that we suggest that islanders should get hundreds of dollars more back in rebates while still funding green programs that we support, things like EV incentives and, pump and heat pump programs. So what's really going on here, Mr. Speaker? I fear that it comes down to a government that is firstly woefully out of touch with the economic reality of most islanders and equally indifferent to the threat facing our planet. Perhaps most shocking, Mr. Speaker, was when the Minister of Finance, who is, of course, tasked with managing public funds, islanders, money, questioned what use $800 in carbon rebates would be to an islander making minimum wage. Well, let me spell it out. It would help pay rent. It would buy groceries. It would make car payments. It would pay for transit passes. It would allow islanders to choose for themselves how best they spend their money, what they need to do with it to get by, and how they can best reduce their carbon footprint. We're in the middle of a climate emergency and a severe economic crisis, yet we have a Minister of Environment who does not believe in carbon pricing, and we have a Minister of Finance who doesn't believe that islanders could use an $800 cheque. And I think we have islanders who increasingly believe that this government is not capable of doing its job. Thank you, Mr. President. Response to questions taken as notice. The Honorable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yesterday uh, I was asked questions by the member from uh, uh, Sherbrooke, Tony Tom Valley, Sherbrooke, and uh, the Occupational Health and Safety OHS Division of Workers' Compensation Board is responsible for enforcing the workplace harassment regulations. Since the regulations came into effect on July 1st, 2020, there have been a total of 27 complaints filed with OHS Division. The breakdown is uh, effective July 1st, 2020, uh, there was five complaints. Uh, 2021, there was 20 complaints, and 2022, so far, there has been eight complaints. Uh, the OHS Division is not aware of any cases where the worker has been fired by an employer because of making work uh, place harassment complaint. Uh, note persistent to the Section 30 of the OHS Act, no employer shall take discriminatory action against a worker for seeking enforcement of the OHS Act and regulations. By doing so, an employer would be considered to be in violation of the legislation. Uh, all complaints that are received by OHS are recorded. OHS has a record of each employer's history and their activities. Therefore, OHS can identify employers that have multiple workplace harassment complaints filed against them. Based on the complaints that OHS has re received, there are no concerning trends related to any particular uh, one employer. Uh, Section 43 of the OHS Act sets out the penalties for violation of the OHS Act and regulations. 
including the workplace harassment regulations. If convicted of a violation, the employer could be fined up to $250,000 and, and or imprisonment for one month. Recommendations for prosecution are made by OHS to the Crown Attorney. There have been no situations where OHS has been recommended prosecution as a result of employer noncompliance or violations of the workplace harassment regulations. Yeah, it's also important to note that a worker can call and talk to the OHS officer about workplace harassment concerns, and this can done, uh, be done safe and confidential, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member from so Social Development and Housing. Minister. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Um, on Friday, March 25th, the member from O'Leary Inverness asked for specifics on benefits for travel a recipient of social assistance or assured income might receive. So, Mr. Speaker, all clients receive a flat rate of $25 per month for travel-related expenses, and then the Department does cover costs of travel related to medical appointments. Uh, the specific answer to the question, as the member confirmed, is $46, as, as clients are provided funding on a per kilometer rate for travel. Um, the funding can be accessed as frequently as needed, and that's an important point for travel. And, Mr. Speaker, the per kilometer rate has not been increased in a number of years, and that's one of the items that the Department will be looking at increasing in the upcoming rate review. And, Mr. Speaker, I have a, a take back for another question as well from that same yes, day. Uh, on Friday, the member from Charlottetown West Royalty asked questions pertaining to support of housing and services offered at Smith Lodge. Um, and, Mr. Speaker, uh, this is really is one page. It won't take too much time. I ask for your indulgence. It's a topic often brought up, and there are many different numbers being used for these, these supportive housing. I want to take the opportunity to provide accurate and up-to-date information. So before the Department took ownership of Smith Lodge, it was a 28-bed community care facility. So then Smith Lodge was opened in December 2020 with space for up to nine identifying men. And at that time, the Community Outreach Centre occupied the additional space at 35 Weymouth Street. That's where Smith Lodge is. And intentions were to move the centre and increase capacity up to 20 beds. Well, Mr. Speaker, eight of these beds are currently occupied by Deacon House clients, and the remaining 10 operate as transitional or supportive housing offered by the Salvation Army. So the remaining rooms, if you do the math, are used for administrative purposes. That's what's going on, including office and meeting spaces. So, Mr. Speaker, there have been 51 clients who have participated in supportive housing since December 2019. This includes 40 male identifying, uh, male identifying clients and 11 female identifying clients. And of those clients who have exited supported housing, the average participation time was about five months. So this information uh, was also provided uh, recently to the member in response to a written question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. else for a response? No? For our first question, I'll call on the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Medical experts from across the country have said that masks are a simple, effective and cheap way to control the spread of COVID. They are also warning that lifting mask mandates and other public health measures will lead to an increase in the number of infections. Some experts are warning that another wave of COVID is inevitable if we remove mask mandates. A question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. Is this government still planning to lift the mask mandate on April the 7th? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, certainly do thank uh, the Leader of the Opposition for that question. Very important, very relevant question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as uh, the member, uh, the leader, uh, mentions the date of April 7th, which is uh, the date that the present emergency health order will expire. Uh, Mr. Speaker, over the last two plus years, we have taken our direction from CPHO. Uh, we will continue to do so, Mr. Speaker. And I know with the ability, the expertise from CPHO and Dr. Morrison that uh, the best recommendations and uh, the best uh, go forward for all Islanders will be coming from Dr. Morrison in your office. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Quebec's public health agency has declared that their province is now officially in a sixth wave with, e with the even more contagious the A2 subvariant of Omicron now being the dominant strain in that province and elsewhere in this country. Case numbers are up sharply and more alarmingly, 
so are hospitalizations. And that's creating serious challenges for their healthcare system. And experts are urging stricter safety controls and in order to stop spread. PEI, after two years of enormous success, now leads North America in terms of cases per capita, and our hospitalization numbers are also on the rise. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. What preparations are you making for another wave of COVID on our island? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank uh, the Leader of the Opposition for the question. Uh, he is absolutely right when you walk across uh, the world, certainly across the country of Canada, uh, that uh, infections of uh, the second... Uh, second variant of Omicron is on the rise. It's becoming the predominant one. Uh, you look, Mr. Speaker, though, we are certainly in a different position right now with the great success that we have had on the island with our partners with regard to vaccination, that we do have antiviral medication, Paxlovid. So these are all factors that I'm sure that our experts, our experts that we do listen to, take into account when they put in place plans, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Leader, the official opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I, saw, I heard a lot of absolutely correct analysis of what's going on and what has gone on, but nothing about preparations for a potential sixth wave here on Prince Edward Island. <laughs> Several ministers and the Premier have put out photos of themselves meeting with various groups and often not wearing their masks. Visitors in the gallery have asked us why they must put on a mask in order to come in this legislature, only to be greeted by MLAs without them. A question to the Minister of Finance and the Deputy Premier. Why aren't all of your government ministers leading by example and wearing their masks? Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I think, Honourable Member, if you look at the LMC rules, we are adhering to those rules and we'll continue to do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Adhering to rules is not being leaders. It's not leading by example. And we need to demonstrate to islanders that we are the ones who are taking great care and we cannot, we cannot create two different standards for ourselves and for others. To the same minister. To the same minister. Do I have the floor, Speaker? Yes, you have the floor. Thank you, Speaker. Here's the floor. To the same minister. Why does the Premier assure us that your government is following Dr. Morrison's guidance, and we just heard it again from the Minister of Health and Wellness, when most of Cabinet seems un unable or perhaps unwilling to follow her advice on masking? Honourable Member, I guess it would, it would be their choice. Um, they're, they're adhering to the rules. We all have the choice in this House to do that. So uh, I can't CPO speak for everyone, but we are following the rules and we'll continue to do that. The speaker, you should be talking to. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've been talking a lot in this House about environmental issues like climate change and water. But one of the other big environmental crises facing us globally, as well as in our province, is the loss of biodiversity. We are in the midst of what scientists describe as the sixth mass extinction event in our planet's history. Species are disappearing at a rate comparable to when the dinosaurs went extinct. Question to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. What impacts does the loss of species pose for our province? Well, I guess that all depends. We heard yesterday from an exchange between a couple of members here about the uh, DFO restrictions on uh, on mackerel and herring. So we're seeing firsthand what is ha happening underwater, uh, above sea. We, we will see it with uh, other both land mammals and other, and other animals that uh, are above ground here. So uh, I think that it could be a great problem for us as far as feeding the world or feeding our population and growing our, our crops here. So. Yeah, the loss of biodiversity is, uh, is very important, and it, it's something I think you'll see that jurisdictions all over the world are working to, to try to solve. And it's some of the things that we're tackling to try to, to uh, get back in, in the right line. But, uh, you know, just like some of the other problems that we have with our carbon emissions, we're pretty far down the road, and the switch is going to have to be hard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Belvedere. 
A recent report from the East Coast Environmental Law points out that protections for endangered species in our province are non-existent. The Wildlife Conservation Act does give the Minister of Environment powers they can use to protect and recover species at risk, but over the 23 years that this legislation has been in place, Mr. Speaker, no minister has ever used it. Our province has never designated any species as endangered. Question to the same minister, why have you taken no action to protect endangered species in our province? The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Speakers, I don't necessarily think that's fair. I don't think it's necessarily fair to look at some of the, the body of work that's done even b before me. But uh, some of the relationships that we have now with Island Nature Trust, where we're protecting sensitive areas so that they can no longer be developed. The, the things that are under NAP protection in this province, the land that the Department of Environment is currently buying and, and has bought a number of parcels just this year to protect, protect those sensitive areas so that they don't go away, so there is habitat there, so, there, so that we do have the opportunity to to save species and, and uh, protect them into the future. So just because some group in Halifax says that we're not doing a good job doesn't mean because we don't invoke a piece of legislation and, and demand people do something doesn't mean that, the, that there's people that aren't already working hard, both volunteer groups and, and people that are employed to do it inside of our, our department and inside the federal government, that they're not doing their job. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Belvedere. If there's that much work going on, Mr. Speaker, it would be great if the Minister could actually table those plans to show that there is something happening. The Wildlife Conservation Act, which is the legislation, allows the Minister to establish an advisory committee to give them expert advice on which species need protection and what needs to be done to protect them. That committee, Mr. Speaker, doesn't exist. Question to the same Minister, why haven't you established this advisory committee? Aren't you interested in listening to advice from experts? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I certainly am, and I have a department full of them that are that are experts in in wildlife, that are in, experts in forestry, that are in, experts in protection, that work every day. That care about the that care about the environment, that care about the, the species that, that that are at risk, that care about protecting uh, spaces so that we don't involve more species and put them in a, a position where they're further at risk. Uh, quite frankly, I am listening to to the experts and. You know, the honourable member likes to, to try to pick at, at small things and say that I'm not doing them because I, I won't bring forward a piece of legislation because we haven't had a chance because I've only been in the chair for a year and have had a net zero plan. I'm working on a climate adaptation strategy. Like, to say that we're not doing nothing is completely preposterous. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. It's tough being minister, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> East Coast Environmental Laws report calls on this minister without delay use his powers and the staff that he has available to him in his department to establish an advisory committee to designate species at risk, to put in protections for those species and their habitats, and to facilitate meaningful public participation in the process. Question to the minister: How about you do some of that? I'm not sure if you're asking me to do it or you're trying to be cheeky, but what I will go back to doing is re relying on my department and the experts that are in them. I'll talk to them and I'll listen to what they want to do and we'll bring forward the pieces of legislation, the policy changes that are, that are needed, or any, any groups or advice reports that are needed based on the advice of the experts in my department. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It came as no surprise to me that in the report on the incidents at East Wilshire School, 100% of teachers' respondents said that they wanted their trans and non-binary students to feel loved and supported in their classes. Mr. Speaker, I bet that this is the case across every school in PEI. The support of a teacher can be life-saving to students, but what those teachers also said is that they needed better support from this government to ensure that they could effect effectively provide this safe space. Question to the Minister of Education. Since the release of that report, how have you increased your support for educators to ensure that they can best support their trans and non-binary students? Honourable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you, Honourable Member, for, for posing this question. And, and certainly, 
the incidences that East Wilshire did bring forward, brought, brought forward to me um, and to all of us uh, some really necessary steps and training that we need to uh, ensure occur within our schools. Mr. Speaker, since that incident, we have rolled out our gender and diversity guidelines across our school system, and all of our staff have been trained on those, all of our school staff. In addition, we did hire a consulting firm um, beyond the brim who's been doing some work specifically with East Wilshire and four other schools. Mr. Speaker, we've been leaning heavily on our partners, such as Peers Alliance and others, to help support uh, both the students population as well as our staff, Mr. Speaker. I've heard from some in the department that there's there's been more work done in the last year um, to support to support this than ever before, Mr. Speaker, and I'm committed to ensuring that that work continues. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Sure. Thomas, Mr. Speaker, and, and on that note, I was talking to a few teachers who feel that they haven't had enough yet, so throw that at you. A trans advocate recently told me that one of the most challenging issues for trans people in PEI, especially youth, is updating names and gender markers on birth certificates. Question to the same minister, have you provided schools with clear information for trans students on how to update their gender markers should they choose to? Don Lopez from Education, Lifelong Learning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and that's an excellent uh, question. I know that's one that's been addressed uh, here in the House um, with the Minister of uh, I believe justice, yeah. Um, certainly I can go back to the, both the department as well as the school authorities to see what type of information has been um, provided to, to the school staff as well as students. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Another challenge that was brought to my attention is the fact that the trans clinic isn't being promoted. Even if people have to wait for months to access the clinic, at least having a clear understanding that it exists, how to access it, and what services it can provide can save lives. Lack of hope in the trans community can literally be a death sentence. Question to the Minister of Health. How do you ensure that this clinic is adequately promoted across the island? The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the Honourable Member for your question. It is an excellent one. There are various uh, ways that uh, the Islanders, so uh, with uh, any concerns, uh, any needs, uh, can find out information with regard to services. Uh, can be the single point of access line, uh, Mr. Speaker. It could be through 811 potentially. It could be through. 2-1-1, Mr. Speaker. Uh, one of the things, too, I'd like to point out, and again, I do, it is an excellent question, but you look at uh, the Women and Gender Diverse Islanders Health Strategy, uh, as some member may be aware of the pillars, that one of them is a sharing of knowledge, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It would be great to see that gender and uh, women and gender diverse Islanders health strategy, Minister. Would it ever. <laughs> Question to the Minister of Education. Is this clinic clearly promoted in island schools? Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning. Again, thank you for the question, um, and certainly that's something I will uh, go back to staff as well as the authorities just to ensure that it is being promoted. And if it's if it's not, um, to the degree that that we'd all uh, we all think it should be, then certainly we'll make sure that it is moving forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Another clear need that was brought to my attention is the need for gender sensitivity training across all government departments. I'll throw this to the same minister. How many departments have participated fully in gender sensitive training? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, I can't speak specifically to the other departments. I'd have to um, get some updated information on that, but certainly as it relates to uh, education, all of our staff have, have been trained, and that's certainly been a priority for us. I know last year it was incorporated into one of our PD days, so again, thank you, Honorable Member, and I can, I can get the information regarding the rest of government. Thank you. Summerside, Wilmot. Speaker, on paper, PEI has at least some rent controls for our citizens. In practice, many of the seniors I've spoken to were not protected from huge rent increases, but one group of islanders not protected at all from huge rent increases is our seniors in private long-term care and community care homes. A question to the Minister of Health. Why are rates charged to self-paying residents in community care and private long-term care not regulated by government? Well, 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it uh, is an excellent question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to answer in detail on that. I want to go back, get the information to make sure that uh, what the information and the question is, uh, is uh, completely accurate, Mr. Speaker. And I don't uh, doubt that, but I do want to go back to the ones in my department, Mr. Speaker, that work on this day in and day out, and I will certainly bring back uh, details on that uh, with regard to the member's question. Thank you. Somerside Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I actually also wanted to see if that was accurate because I looked into it. I had one of my constituents talk to me about a family member of hers who is in a long-term care center that is private, and they recently received a huge increase in their rent, and they were told when they called the department to call the home and try to negotiate it for themselves. Now, this is absolutely their home. And uh, my question to the minister is, I would appreciate it if you would go back and look at that and then bring an answer to this house on how we can justify increases like this for seniors who clearly don't have additional money. I'd be interested to know your thoughts on that, minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank the Honourable Member for bringing uh, this forward, and I certainly uh, will bring uh, that back, and uh, be more than happy to, with regard to uh, the individual, the senior, uh, uh, that uh, the Member is referring to, that uh, if uh, the Member would like to have a sidebar for a discussion, I'd be more than happy to do that as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since asking the Minister about plans for the Borden Fabrication Yard, I have been contacted by several Islanders who have suggestions for the area that don't involve for-profit business, but would have positive benefits for the community, such as creating a natural area with uh, concrete structures, making ideal habitat for, um, uh, for wildlife to grow, um, or a renewable energy uh, showcase site, a couple of the ideas I've heard. Question to the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, were any possible uses for this area considered that did not involve for-profit pro business and that might not require government to pay to remove the cement structures? The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member. So uh, one thing we've done is committed to clean up the fab yard. Obviously, uh, it's, uh, it's an eyesore the way the concrete sits there when, uh, when islanders and, uh, and tourists hit, uh, hit the bridge, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what I can say is that the, as of today, uh, there's nothing finalized on what, uh, what that is going to be utilized for. One thing uh, I would say is uh, we want to make sure the community of Borden and the residents are supportive of whatever goes there. And, uh, and any idea uh, we'll certainly look at, Mr. Speaker. So uh, feel free, Honourable Member, to, uh, to uh, bring those ideas forward. I, I plan on sitting down with the community of Borden, and uh, we're going to proceed. Thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A constituent of mine reached out after getting a hefty bill, just over $4,000, from the hospital after her mother-in-law had been a patient while waiting for a long-term care bed. To her, and my surprise, Mr. Speaker, it turns out that on PEI, if you are in the hospital waiting for a long-term care bed to open up, you are charged almost $100 a day. Question to the Minister of Health. Why are, this, are seniors who are waiting in hospital by no fault of their own charged for their stay and not available for subsidization? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for that question. It's something that I brought up with staff. Actually, uh, it would be uh, earlier this week or late last week. Uh, it's a concern that I had heard previously. I'll be honest, Mr. Speaker, I've not heard it recently. But with regard to ALC patients who uh, obviously are medically discharged, there's certainly a number of them awaiting long-term care placement. My complete feeling, and my staff are aware of it, is that they should not be billed at the same rate as uh, the member had indicated of so much on a per day basis, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I think we have to look at subsidization rates and, uh, as well uh, to make sure that they are covered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. John the Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, for the past approximately five weeks, we have been debating the operating budget presented by the Minister of Finance. After approximately five weeks of scrutinizing and debating the budget, just yesterday we were made aware of a $9.6 million oh. accounting error. 
that the minister drastically downplayed when tabling a revised copy of the incorrect budget page. Minister, misrepresenting the placement of $9.6 million is not a minor administrative correction, as you mentioned yesterday, especially when it relates to your new carbon plan given to opposition parties in the final days prior to when it was supposed to be implemented. Question to the Minister of Finance. When did you become aware of this error? Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member, the, the error does not uh, affect the bottom line. It's just a transposition of numbers. Uh, we've been working with my department uh, for a few days now, for sure, maybe. And we wanted to make sure that everything else in the, in the book was aligned up. We double-checked. I asked them to go back and double-check, and they did that. I have full confidence in, in my department, and we'll continue to, to work together. The, the uh, revenue is not debated on the floor of the House, so uh, it's something that we didn't catch right away, and I will, I will admit that. But it is not debated on the floor of the House, but, Honourable Member, it does not affect the bottom line of the budget. Donald Lee, the third party. I'm quite aware of that, Honourable. Member, and uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. But there was a mistake, and this is one of the most important documents that your government puts forward to this floor. People are human. Mistakes happen. But this is not a mistake you can simply blame on an unlinked spreadsheet and shrug off as, a, as no big deal. You advised this House that you, were instruct, that you instructed your staff to conduct a review of the budget in its entirety, given this error. Question to the Minister. How long did your staff have to conduct this review, and do you now stand by your budget and, and commit that there are no more further errors? Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. I will stand by the budget. I'll stand by the Department. And I can assure Islanders that the budget book that we have now is correct. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Third Party, Second Supplementary. Well, thanks, Mr. Speaker. So I'll, I, I guess she answered it, but I'm still going to ask this, fine, this last supplementary. Because it's wrong numbers, that's why. That's OK. Take shots at me. That's all right. Go ahead. You guys uh, uh, profess that you're, uh, there's no heckling in this House and you fellas control the decorum. Go ahead. Take shots at me. Mr. Speaker, this error does not lie in, public, in the public servants in the Department of Finance. It is solely the responsibility of the Minister to ensure that the money collected by island taxpayers is appropriately represented in the most important document that government presents to this legislature. Question to the Minister. Will you stand and acknowledge that this error is ultimately your responsibility mm -hmm. and, any, and that any misrepresentation of revenue collected is, is more important than calling it a minor administrative correction? Thank you, Honorable Mr. Minister, Speaker. Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Speaker. And Honourable Member, I think I've already done that. I stand behind the budget book. I stand behind the department. And I assure all Islanders that the numbers we now have are correct. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Larry Inverness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with PEI now having the dubious distinction of ranking first in number of COVID cases per capita in the recent John Hopkins University COVID data update for North America, and as this government moves forward with learning to live with COVID, one must assume that uh, we must also learn to work and return our health care system to manage its operations uh, with this new reality. Unit 3 in the QEH is operating as a province's primary COVID uh, unit. Previously, it was a 36-bed medical unit and cared for many older adults awaiting long-term care. Question the Minister of Health. What is the plan for Unit 3 at the QEH? How many beds does this uh, unit currently have designated for COVID, and how many general beds are operating in this unit? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it's great for the Honourable Member, former Minister of Health, to have those stats of information right in front of him to be able to read it off. Mr. Speaker, I do not know on a day-in, day-out basis how many beds are operational in each unit at our various facilities across the province, Mr. Speaker, and the reason that I don't is because of the vastness of the system, first of all. But even more importantly, Mr. Speaker, is that I, like my colleagues on this side of the House, have faith in the experts that work in our health care system and in our departments right across the board, day in and day out, to provide the best services that they can to Islanders and will continue to do for Islanders. Thank you. Larry Infinas. Mr. Speaker, I'm well aware of what the role is as a minister, and it is the minister's role to make sure that he's informed and updated so he can inform this legislature of facts and information. Yes, I get he doesn't have to know every number, Mr. Speaker, but these are pretty 
important numbers that you would assume he'd be updated on. Part of the plan to increase capacity for COVID patients included six geriatric psychiatry beds at Hillsborough Hospital, beds that were always full. The area has now been renovated to house the Child and Youth Psychiatry Unit at Unit 9. Question to the Minister, when will we see a reopening of these six geriatric beds as we move forward with the high COVID numbers? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I heard uh, the Honourable Member's colleague uh, uh, state good question, and, and I agree, it is, it's a good question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with that, I will go back to the Department, get the exact information, uh, Mr. Speaker, and bring it back for the House, and certainly for uh, the Honourable Member who asked the question. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Mullary Inverness. I would appreciate it to get the facts, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we see the opening of the psychiatric, psychi psychiatric urgent care clinic during the early years of COVID. Uh, this was an effort to divert mental health patients from the emergency department to receive more streamlined care. Unfortunately, this service did not last very long and has since closed. Question to the Minister of Health. A recent CBC media interview with uh, ER physician Dr. Trevor Jane revealed 20 to 25 percent of ER visits are mental health related. Why would you get rid of this service like this when the data shows it's clearly needed? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and again thank uh, uh, the Honourable Member for uh, the question. Mr. Speaker, as former Minister of Health, as a former Minister of Health, he would know these decisions are not made by the Minister. They are made, or at least I would hope that they weren't in his time period. They're made by the experts, Mr. Speaker. We look at, uh, he uh, references a number of uh, mental health related um, emergency room department visits. And yes, that is a concern, without a doubt. But Mr. Speaker, you look at some of the other initiatives that we are undertaking. Just for example, at uh, Queen Elizabeth Hospital, with regard to the mental health ER unit, with regard to the short stay beds there, Mr. Speaker, with regard to mobile response, with regard to single point of access, all of these are initiatives of this government to address what we know is a challenge and to provide those services that are needed Two Islanders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I had a great exchange last week with the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. I figured I'd go back and follow up on e-bike or electric bike incentives. I had the chance to uh, check out e-bikes. I didn't know a lot about them before in an event last summer uh, that the Minister put on in District 10 by the Canadian Tire in Charlottetown. Um, others that were there were very impressed by these e-bikes. Now, the rebate is, I've heard, is $500 for an e-bike. Now, comparing that to some other jurisdictions across Canada, Mr. Speaker, BC, I think, is over $1,000. Alberta, I believe, is over $1,000. Question to the Minister, is the $500 for a rebate set in stone, or is that a number that you can look at sure. to maybe increase ridership? The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So it's a good question. I mean, we do do a jurisdictional scan whenever we look at bringing any program forward, and uh, we usually start in the maritime loop, and I think ours is matched, matched us up identical to what Nova Scotia's is, so we kind of based our program off of what they had, but we're going to run it for uh, a year or two, see how it works, see what the volume uh, is going to be like in stores, and see what the uptake is going to be, and uh, as, as always, all these policies are always open for review. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Winslow. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, of course, it's no secret. We hear it in the news every day, the supply issues, the supply shortages. I know that a lot of people are wanting to get electric cars or electric vehicles, and of course, there is a shortage. There is a shortage, actually, as well on e-bikes, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Uh, my question to the same minister is, because it is getting harder to find these e-bikes, especially here in PEI, and we know everyone wants to support local, uh, would this rebate extend to someone if they had to purchase the or the e-bike off island the honorable minister of environment energy and climate action thank you mr speaker that's another good question so we're still in the final stages of trying to put our program together i i would like to be able to say we'd announce it this week i kind of had april 1st in my mind but <coughs> we're we're a couple got a couple more steps to make to get it done so it'll probably be next week but uh we will give it consideration but all of our programs are facing the, the same problems right now we hear all the time about the EV market, the people are taking us up on our incentives, but there's a year or 18 month wait sometimes for, for new vehicles, so they're, they're really backed up. But uh, I do, uh, my understanding there were a considerable amount of, of e-bikes on the island and the folks at All EV had told me that they had some, that, but that was last fall and they may have since moved them, but 
We, uh, I'll check with my staff because they're the ones who've talked to all the vendors and see what uh, what their thoughts are. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Winslow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do think it might be beneficial. Of course, we do want to support local, but if you can't support local, maybe that rebate incentive would be good. Um, another huge benefit to these e-bikes, Mr. Speaker, is you know it doesn't help the city's coffers here in Charlottetown, but uh, if you're working downtown and you take your e-bike, uh, you don't have to pay for parking. Now, the hope is that we will have a lot more people using e-bikes. Um, one quick question. is an event last year at West Royalty Elementary, a bike uh, to work day. There were more bikes than there was available places to put them. I'm wondering if the minister has had any conversations, Mr. Speaker, with either the municipalities or any businesses about maybe expanding bike racks. Honorable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So we are actually going to uh, be putting money forward to build bike racks through the Active Transportation Fund. We did some last year for schools across Prince Edward Island. We partnered with Holland College in Georgetown. Actually, the students built the bike racks and we distributed them to schools across the island. So yeah, we're looking to continue that, that program and, and create partnerships with different communities who, who may require more than what, what we're trying to do with our own provincial entities. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, uh, I don't know if this is even needed because of the popularity of e-bikes, uh, because they do have so many benefits, Mr. Speaker. Of course, uh, they promote uh, active uh, wellness, and uh, they're also helping reduce our carbon uh, input, our carbon uh, footprint, rather. Um, I'm wondering if the minister has any marketing plans to really promote these as a way for an alternative for someone like myself getting to work every day. Honorable Minister for Environment, Energy, and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So yeah, that's a, a long-term goal, and I think that if you, you ask around, there's, a, there's probably a different comfort level with traveling around with the current uh, infrastructure that's in place. So that's why we're trying to build up communities and partner with Charlottetown and Stratford and Summerside and, and Cornwall, some of our, our bigger jurisdictions, to make sure that they have those bike lanes built. And of course, we're working with our smaller jurisdictions too. So I think we still have some work to do on the infrastructure front in some of the municipalities to make it ultra safe, but yeah, we need to promote it. The goal is to have people taking uh, their walking or biking in some form of biking to uh, to work to cut down on our carbon emissions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, we passed legislation earlier this spring, and, uh, and I know it is not your department's legislation, but I know you being a very active minister, you would uh, probably have these conversations with your other cabinet ministers. Um, now, this legislation that we passed will allow municipalities to pass their own laws uh, regarding bikes or e-bikes being used on sidewalks. A question to the minister, is this a conversation that has been brought up to you? The Honorable Minister of Environment, Energy, and uh, like Transportation speak. Infrastructure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, the, the reason I'm rising to this specific question is it uh, would relate more to, towards my department. And uh, certainly we are having those conversations um, with, uh, with municipalities. Uh, as you're fully aware, or would be aware, uh, we did bring in legislation already to allow municipalities to, to govern uh, bicycles on, on uh, sidewalks in their own communities. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, we're also looking at, uh, at uh, what's allowable on uh, active transportation trails, such as the one that comes across the Confederation Bridge, because as, as EV uh, bikes and, uh, and tricycles and, and other uh, uh, forms of uh, mechanized uh, electric transportation comes into stream, we have to be uh, very careful, very concerned about what is uh, used and uh, where it's being used. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Winslow, your second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I appreciate the uh, Minister of Transportation Infrastructure rising to answer that question. I guess this question would probably go to him as well. Um, and again, maybe it is more of a city issue. That's the problem we run sometimes as urban MLAs. But um, in my area specifically, if I were to take an e-bike to work, I would have to walk for probably about two kilometers with my bike before I would get into a bike lane or a thing. And again, I know this is probably more in the city's legislation, but again, I just wanted to make sure that those are conversations that I'm hearing, and I'm wondering if the minister has heard them in his talks to the, with the municipalities. Honorable Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, certainly there are uh, different rules in different municipalities and, and uh, in, in non-incorporated areas as well. And, and so, yes, we are working very closely with the uh, PEI Federation of Municipalities uh, on this issue. And uh, uh, we're, we're trying to bring everyone together because the last thing we want is a really piecemeal um, 
set of rules across the island. It has to be consistent, it has to be safe, and it has to be recognizable for, for all users. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke. With food prices skyrocketing, food insecurity is a growing concern for low-income islanders, with single women and lone parent families being particularly vulnerable. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Other than in-school food programs, what are you doing to ensure single women and families are able to, uh, to put food on the table? The Honorable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, in particular with our new uh, Poverty Elimination Strategy Act in place. This is an area that we're very concerned about in the department. And Mr. Speaker, what we've done is we've, uh, we've raised uh, the rates um, recently. We, we, did, uh, we raised them last year, um, and then we, we gave a, a, um, a one-time amount at Christmas time to families. And Mr. Speaker, we're looking to, uh, to raise them again this year. I look forward to having the budget on the floor. We can talk about that. But we want to make sure that uh, we eliminate food insecurity. We want people to have food security. We want to make sure that, in particular, families have the food they need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Time to Alan Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I believe the minister is talking about raising the rates uh, for social assistance, which is important. But there are also low-income islanders who are the working poor, mm -hmm. um, and they're, they not, they're not helped. Women and gender diverse small business owners have also been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and rising costs. Question to the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. What programs and supports have been put in place that specifically meet the needs of women and gender diverse folks in business? Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, all the member, for the question. So uh, over the course of the last year, we've rolled out many programs through uh, skills and innovation uh, that would uh, exactly uh, help women get back into the workforce, upskill, uh, as well as uh, some entrepreneurship as well, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there's been good discussion through the department, and we're always working to, to improve. I can get a full list of everything that uh, not only do we have in place now that we're working on and uh, get it to you, Honourable Member. Thank you. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Minister, could you also let me know uh, of the existing programs available, what has the uptake been by women and gender diverse islanders? Honourable Member, Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't have them exact numbers here, Honourable Member, but we've had actually had great uptake. Uh, it's uh, it's it's nice to see that the programs have been working. Uh, we see the stats can numbers that come out to, to show that the programs are working, and uh, I can get all those details and, and bring them back to you tomorrow. And uh, we're going to continue working forward on these programs, Mr. Speaker. Always looking for suggestions, so feel free to bring any to to me. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank Final you. question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The world is awash in promises that are never kept. This seems particularly true when we talk climate action. On PEI, this government is doing even better, claiming to lead the pack when it comes to net zero. Yes, the government is leading the pack, but sadly only when it comes to promises. Question to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. I hope you will actually answer the question. Why are you waiting eight years for Canada to impl implement the net zero code instead of bringing the PEI building code to net zero now? Are you leading the pack or not? The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, you know what? The, the Honourable Member has brought this up uh, before to this House. He, it's a good point. We, we do need to know that the buildings that are being built now, and there's a lot of them, if you look around Charlton in particular, there's buildings being built everywhere that they are going to be to some code that's going to be clo close enough to net zero that we can bring them there because the last thing we want is to get in the final leg of our journey to our 2030 goals and our 2040 goals and have to retrofit buildings that are six or seven years old. So what I will tell you, though it, it rests with my honourable colleague over there, I will I have a, I'll talk to him about can we do it early? What would the implications be? And I'll get back to you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of question period. Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member from Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise on a point of order. Uh, early in the question period, the Leader of the Opposition insinuated that the members that are sitting over here, particularly he noted Cabinet, were uh, breaking some sort of rule by not wearing a mask while they were at their seat. And I do want to note that LMC makes the rules of this assembly. The, the honourable member sits on, on legislative management. Rules were su submitted to uh, the chief public health officer as far as what our 
plan would be to operate in this house and were approved. So what I'm looking for, Mr. Speaker, is a ruling on whether or not members who are sitting here without a mask on are breaking the rules of the assembly. Thank you. <coughs> Honourable Minister, I'll take that under advisement and report back to the House. Okay, statements by Ministers. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we can all agree that the cost of living is on the rise. This affects every single islander, and as a government, we need to step up to help wherever we can. Mr. Speaker, the men and the women of the island fire services are no different. They are seeing increased costs when buying specialized equipment and maintaining them also. While municipal governments play an important role in funding local fire departments, we know that there can be a lot to be done with the lack of fundraising that has not happened. In the last two years has been a challenging time to organize and hold any fundraising activity at our local fire services. That is why today, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to say that we are going to be offering each fire department $10,000 to help them buy or maintain life-saving equipment so that they can do the important job of keeping our community safe. At this At this time, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Minister of Justice and Public Safety for joining me in this, this initiative. The PEI Fire School will also be receiving $10,000 to help with their operations. We all know how important this institution is. As you know, Mr. Speaker, as a previous firefighter, if you want to become an island firefighter, you go through the fire school. Providing them this additional grant will help with training, recruitment, and retaining efforts all of which are necessary for the next generation of firefighters. Mr. Speaker, in total, this one-time grant of $360,000 is an investment in the people who help keep our community safe. I'm proud that we as a government can make this contribution and acknowledge the work of the Rural Development Agency does with our fire services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Summerside South Drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any announcement that uh, we're getting more funding for our firefighters is a good one. I mean, I, I've sat down with firefighters across the table from me and heard stories of, uh, due to a lack of funding, showing up at a fire and the rules keeping that firefighter from going in to save people and, and the, the impact that's, that had on that firefighter. So any funding we can give to our firefighters um, to prevent these kinds of things that break our heroes is a good thing. So the more funding, the better to our firefighters. I applaud this announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member from Tignish Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, too, want to uh, thank the Minister for this announcement. Um, we all know that uh, these brave individuals who are courageous put their name forward um, to to help all Islanders to go where, um, you, you know, they deal with situations that I know personally I couldn't deal with. So it takes a very special person to do what they do. And the majority of our firefighters in Prince Edward are volunteers, so they give of themselves. Um, so to have um, $10,000 go back into a fire department, especially these volunteer fire departments, again, who the firefighters not only do what they can to help uh, the community and help every islander, but they also help fundraise to keep these fire departments open. So $10,000 of life saving equipment is going to go a long way um, to to help uh, these these smaller ones, especially um, right across Prince Edward Island. So I, uh, I commend the minister for, for for this announcement, for looking into this, for giving us money. Now I'm just waiting on the minister of justice to make an announcement that is going to be local counseling support for uh, volunteer firefighters immediately. Thank you. <coughs> End of statements by ministers. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker. Oh, sorry. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a document from Endo Act Canada, which outlines their, um, their plan for the need for action on endometriosis in Canada. And I move, seconded by Vic Charlton Victoria Park, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall it carry? Any more documents? Did I miss yes. anyone? The Honourable Member from Mermaid, Stratford, and the Government House Leader. 
Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table an email from Matthew Crossman dated on December 1st. Um, this email outlines uh, thank you of an appreciation of time spent with the official opposition, and um, I, I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, that the said table be now received and do lie on the table. Sean Carey. Another one? Mr. Speaker. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table an email from me to um, an official within Island EMS, thanking him for his time to coming to meet with the official opposition in our office, um, and accepting his offer to tour the Island EMS facility, and especially looking forward to um, s sitting within ditch dispatch so I could see what the day of the life of the paramedic was. Unfortunately, I don't have a response to that because I never received one. And I move, seconded by Charlottetown Victoria Park, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall we carry? End of documents. Reports by committees. The Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As Chair of the Standing Committee on Rules, Regulations, Private Bills and Privileges, and following the receipt of report on Private Bill Number 200 of the said committee from yesterday, March 30th, I move, seconded by the Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, that the report of the committee be adopted. As a result of the deliberations, your committee is pleased to make the following recommendation to the Member of the Legislative Assembly. Your committee, having considered Private Bill 200, an act to amend the St. Dunstan's University Act, finds that it, excuse me, finds it to be private in nature and recommends that the fee be waived. I appreciate everyone on the committee taking the time to meet so quickly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to the report? No? Shall I carry? Yes. Introduction of government bills. Government motions. Orders of the day, government. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action that the first order of the day be now read. Shirley Carey. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action that this House do now resolve itself into committee the whole House to take into consideration uh, grant of supply to Her Majesty. Charlotte Carey. Carey. The Honourable Member from Tignesh Pomerol, Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please.
The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the grant of supply to Her Majesty. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? granted. Honourable members, we are on page 110, the Department of Health and Wellness. The section Community Care Facility and Private Nursing Home Inspection has been read and is currently under debate. One ten. Last section on one ten. Okay. Would you please state your name and position for Hansard? Sure. Karen Stanley, Director of Finance, Department of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much and welcome. Again, as I said, we're on the section Community Care Facility and Private Nursing Home Inspection. It has been read currently under debate. Any questions? Shall us up? Oh. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. So where we had left off on this was we were talking about inspections for private, um, for, sorry, for community care facilities and private um, nursing homes. There had been a lot of questions asked in the leading up to that section. Is there any documentation that can be tabled on questions that were taken as notice in, the, um, in those debate days? Or have they all been tabled? Uh, you're speaking about uh, when we uh, went through the first two sections and started on this one, uh, member? Yeah. yeah. They, uh, they have not been tabled at this point in time. Uh, staff are working on them and would anticipate that they will be tabled uh, tomorrow or at the latest next Tuesday. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. Um, so, um, based on, you know, the presentation that we had um, at the standing committee um, where um, we had your department officials come in and discuss what was going on in private nursing homes and community long-term care homes. Um, is the, was there a sense that we needed to improve and um, increase the number of inspections that we do at those, at those homes? My apologies, but if you could uh, repeat the question. Could you repeat the question, Mary Stafford? Sure. So we had a lot of discussion at the standing committee um, about the inspections and the rate of inspections and whether we were doing enough, especially when it comes to COVID guidelines, right, and ensuring isolation protocols were being, in, um, were being put in place. So we've had some more outbreaks since the last time we sat reviewing this. And I'm just wondering, um, do we have enough in this budget to ensure that Islanders that are living in those homes have the, enough security to ensure that the inspection levels are increased and that they are rightfully protected? Uh, sorry. Karen, I believe that the addition is in this section. This is for the inspection. <laughs> So as we had noted in the last one, we do have an additional uh, inspector who will be working on um, in, in assisting with the inspections as well as working on events and complaints and such. In addition, we did receive funding under the Safe Restart Agreement from the federal government, which will help with inspections, infection control, and uh, helping facilities improve their areas. So I guess my personal opinion is, yes, there are sufficient funds in the budget. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And there was a, quite a bit of money available through the federal program. Mm -hmm. Is all of that money being used and uh, allocated? Between 21, 22, and 22, 23, yes, it will be. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And can you tell me how often we inspect these homes on a regular basis, and will that be increasing at all given COVID? I'll have to bring that back. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. And I think we all agree there's five FTEs that are being used. There was four FTEs plus one casual, I believe is what there was. Mm -hmm. And that is for all of the long-term care homes uh, and uh, community care facilities across the province. Um, when we, when an inspector goes out, are those, are those homes aware that the inspection is happening? Uh, yes. Um, I'd have to bring that back. I'm not sure. 
Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And how are complaints handled? So when somebody um, contacts a community care um, home or a long-term care home, how how um, is does that funnel through the system? Because um, I, I, I mean, honestly, I've talked to a number of families who are concerned that when they are um, lodging a complaint or you know putting something forward that it reflects poorly on their family member that might be staying in the long-term care home. And so how are those complaints handled? Is it is there a confidential process or does that ever float up into your department if, you, um, if there's public complaints or does it just go to the long-term care home and stay there? Chair? Uh, I will bring back uh, the exact process that uh, is undertaken there. Uh, be completely honest, member. I don't see those unless at uh, various uh, uh, a provisional license, for example, I am updated at those times. But uh, we'll bring back that exact process. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. And uh, speaking of provisional licenses, so um, how so how long does how long yeah. do you allow a, um, a home to go on a provisional license before serious discussions um, begin? I know we've talked, there's been questions in the House around one that's on a, well, I think there's two on provisional licenses. So what can Islanders expect there? Sure. Uh, what Islanders can expect is uh, the same uh, member as what I expect that we do have the professionals that are doing the inspections, that there is a process in place uh, uh, if there are certain uh, criteria that are not being met, that uh, the, then a provisional license would be put in place by the board. Uh, how long am I? Uh, I'm not going to overstep the bounds of the board. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. But is there a process in place in which if they don't um, satisfy the board that it then goes to the minister to make the minister aware? Like, is there a standard process there? Uh, Chair, as I said before, yes, when the provisional licenses are put in place, uh, I would be notified. But I'm not going to put uh, uh, the board in a position where I back and, you know, actually question one way or the other on that group the reissuance of, uh, of a provisional license or the reissuance of the license. Mermaid Stratford. Okay. I think I'm good, Chair. Shall a section carry? Carry. carry. Emergency health services appropriations provided to support provincial emergency health related policy and programs including ambulance services, air ambulance, telehealth 811, blood services, and organ and tissue donation and transport. Plantation. Administration, 15,300. Material supplies and services, 1,100. Professional services, 14,833,300. Salaries, 482,000. Travel and training, 5,900. Grants, 5,346,100. Total emergency health services, 20,683,700. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. So when I'm talking to Islanders, several of them say, let's follow the money. So. I would really like to dig down into this section. So this contains the contract for um, emergency ambulance services. So the Medivy contract is in here, correct? And can you tell me of, I, I see it's written here. So can you tell me how much of this budget, the of the 20,683 specifically goes to um, Medivy. Uh, Stranger, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding that uh, in this budget, and again, please feel free to uh, to jump in if mm -hmm. I'm not accurate, but uh, uh, for transports and ground ambulance, sir. Honorable member, uh, sorry, Minister, yes. um, we're having difficulty hearing you. Um, I'm just asking a few things. One is, number one, but we don't hear through your mic, but if you could just speak up a little bit, if, if you don't sure. mind, we would appreciate it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, my understanding is that there is 13,784,000. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And can you walk us through what, those, what that covers? 
what that uh, budget covers. In what regards? So it's the ground ambulance services that is the bulk of it. In addition, there's seniors transports and hospital transports. Um, are you looking for more detail in addition to that? Sure. Can you tell me how much of the 13 million is seniors transports? Sure. Uh, seniors transports is 956,300. Okay. Where are we? Sorry? Oh, and the hospital okay. transports are 492,400. Mermaid, Stratford. Okay, so that leaves just over just over 11 million that goes into the grand the ground service. That's correct. That okay. Mermaid Stratford? Just over 12. Just over 12 million. Okay, thank you. My math wasn't great there, but um, okay. So that is all sole source to to one company. Is that accurate? There was an original RFP back in 2006, and since then, in accordance to the agreement, it has been extended. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And in the revenues, how much in revenues does the province collect? Is there any amount of money from the ground service, um, um, emergency services collected in revenue by the province, or is that all collected by the company operating the, the service? It's not collected by the province. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. So that $150 that every resident pays in order to take an ambulance to, you know, to a hospital or whatever, mm -hmm. that is all paid to the, the private company? That is correct, with the exception of the seniors and now the palliative care, which the province pays. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And does the province subsidize that um, emergency trip at all? Or is the actual cost $150? Uh, yes, the province would subsidize uh, a portion of that member. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Can you tell me how much that the subsidy, subsidy is from the province for that? We'll bring that back, that exact amount. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think, you know, reporting is really important, and I... I'd like to understand what reporting you receive from from this private company on the uh, services that they provide to the province. We will bring that back, Chair. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Um, to, is can you at least tell me if it's a weekly, daily, monthly, yearly, or never kind of report that you get on an, on a regular basis? As I said, Chair, we'll bring uh, the details back on that. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. So that I struggle, uh, I have to say, I struggle with that answer because how reporting is important. I would think that based on um, the amount of discussion and the amount of times we've asked for information to be brought back. So when you do bring back information, is that getting, are you receiving that directly from MetaV on a case-by-case -case scenario? Uh, Chair, when uh, you say a case-by-case -case scenario, uh, maybe a, a little elaboration? Mary right. Stratford. So, for instance, when one of the members of this house asks you, "What's the response time from O'Leary to West Point on a river?" and you come back to this house to provide that information um, as a response taken by notice, are you getting that information directly from MetaV whenever one question is asked, and then you have to go back every time that question is asked to get that information from the company? Yes, it would uh, be uh, when you ask uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, yes, I would go back and ask for the information uh, for that time period, member. Uh, certainly, is, uh, as I'm sure you can appreciate, 
throughout the day, uh, response times may vary to a certain extent. Uh, but uh, there is the information here, Karen, I believe, with regard to the response times. Yes. But this would be over an extended time period. It would also compare uh, quarters of one year to quarters of previous years and the like. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And so is that information that you get like on a quarterly basis or do you get it on a more up-to-date basis? If you have in front of you, for instance, if you have something that's showing you what the difference is quarter after quarter, is that just something that you get on a sporadic or? We definitely get it on a quarterly basis. Um, I'm not sure if you mean, do we get it like on a monthly basis? I know we do receive it on a quarterly basis. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. So, I mean, I can tell you when I used to work for a private company, um, we would report daily, weekly, monthly, mm -hmm. quarterly, yearly. Um, that's just something that you do in a, in a private company. So I would assume that there is very um, explicit reporting that's happening from that private company. What I'm trying to get at is, are they keeping that in-house or do you, does your department, knowing that you're auto-renewing co um, contracts and you have done that for the last three years, is there nothing set up with the, comp with the department in order for you to be fed information on a regular basis so that you can monitor whether the service is meeting what expectations we might have? We would have to consult with the director of the area and get that information and bring it back to you. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. So I just, just to, I'm not, it's not a gotcha moment. It's just like you are the head of this. You decide who gets this contract and whether we re, renegotiate it um, or however. This all resides within the Department of Health and Wellness and I'm finding it hard to understand how you don't, you're not even sure if we have reporting, or is it that you you get reporting, you just, I would think that you're looking at it if you if you get it, which is why I want to know, are you receiving reporting, and are you, are you watching that, knowing how many issues are coming up, and what paramedics are saying every day um, is their experience? And if you're, I'm just going to clear that by that with a question. And if you're not, is there funding in here for you to build a reporting system so that you can actually track how this private company is performing so that you can make informed decisions? Chair, sure. uh, you look at uh, the salaries portion, we look at uh, the staff that are uh, under this section. Uh, yes, that is their role, their responsibility, and uh, as minister, yes, they would report to me without a doubt, but uh, with that, again, as I've said before, I do have uh, confidence in the employees within all sections of health and wellness, health PEI, but certainly in this section, and that would be their responsibility. In all fairness, uh, members, I'm going to give you one more question now, and then I'm going to move on to a few others on the list, but I will come back to you if you choose. Yeah, I appreciate okay. that. So, Mermaid Stratford. Okay. And just to make a point, it's not that I don't have confidence. If the, inf if the reporting's not happening, the reporting's not happening, and we just need to admit that there's no reporting and you're not getting accurate, up-to-date information so that you can make informed decisions on whether a contract should be renewed or not. So... Um, do we know how many off-island transfers, because we pay, f the province pays for the off-island transfers. Do you know how many off-island transfers are done on a weekly basis? That, uh, we will bring that information back, but uh, I would like to quantify that, that that is going to vary week to week. I didn't hear, sorry, I have to, okay. I'm gonna find headphones. No, if you sure. like, I yep. can. Shoot uh, a little louder. Well, no, that's all right. I mean, the Minister, we know that you're uh, kind of a soft-spoken gentleman, and we don't want you to strain your voice, because I think you're going to be here for a while. Um, however, all members are supplied with headphones in their desk, so if they if they are having difficulty hearing, I would ask that you please put them on. So, um, O'Leary Inverness? 
couple questions here. Is uh, and it goes back to the issue of reporting that the member from uh, Mermaid Stratford talked about. And I brought up in the legislature that there was, you know, a number of quarters <coughs> that there was no reporting. So, so. I'm going with the assumption that the, that it's out of the MS that reports to your department. It's your department that posts it on the website, or is it uh, directly posted by Island DMS? We'll get uh, the exact procedure for uh, you, member, on that. Oh, Larry Inverness. So, so I guess that's what, so. Last time there was three quarters that there was no post enough response dates. I mean, you eventually they, they miraculously showed up after a few questions in the house here, but now we're at another quarter is completed as of today. One would be an expectation of when that would be posted uh, for the first quarter of 2022. Uh, Chair, yep. uh, a great question. Uh, mm -hmm. I really uh, agree with you. Uh, there should be a certain time limit or time frame for the public that the expectation is there and the requirement there to have that posted. Uh, with that, as far as what the, that uh, requirement is, member, uh, we'll bring that back. Well, See, from my time as a minister, I was, it was kind of like one of those regular, <laughs> I'd be waiting for these postings to sort of, once again, to take a look and peruse the, the response times, mostly for my own district, you know, as far as the O'Leary zone and trying to see how those numbers were going. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can play with the numbers a little bit in, in regards that, uh, but there's trend lines. And if I look at the, in the O'Leary zone right now, I think for the last posting for the month of December, uh, we've seen uh, that that response time has increased by about six minutes, seven minutes, which is concerning because that's quite a jump. And, uh, and that's why, you know, for me, when I identify that, and that's why I think it's very important for you as a minister to, you know, be very responsive to these uh, statistics as you get them out and to certainly question, you know, what happened there. And, uh, and like I say, we'll, we'll see, they, they spike mm -hmm. month to month, so I, I get that. But it's, it's rarely in minutes they might spike. It's usually a, as an average more by second. So I, I really get concerned about that. So I think that's a, a valid question to find out how long it takes to posting. When they do post them by quarter, they are posted monthly. So you would, you'd have to start to assume that they would at least have January, February's numbers already done. Uh, so that would give you a little bit of an indication as a minister. Uh, my other question is that from this section, so there's 1418 million, you, you sort of responded a little bit with the with Island EMS or Medivy, but are there any other sections where there would be monies transferred to Island EMS or, or Medivy? And the one I'm thinking about is like palliative care and some of those services, or is all everything that they get would be in that 14.8 million? There would be other sections. Yes. So there are other sections. There is funding under the grants, and in the grants area, that would be where our out of province travel is paid to them, as well as. Uh, Right. Out of province transport, um, as well as funding for the uh, the radio, the PIX radio system, and um, different types of. Sorry, I'm going to get the actual tool of. Um, to make sure that they have their response, uh, their CPR training and the proper technology and such. So, well, so, so that's more for like staff training of the paramedics yes. themselves and mm -hmm. things like that. So when you say on the, the radio systems, uh, so is that more what we're talking about for the 911 system that they have in place? To ensure that they have the same, the paramedics and the, the uh, dispatch has the same system as the, the 911 system uses. O'Leary and Vernus. Is that a one-time expense or? No, that's the annual cost. An annual cost. Okay, I'll eventually want to know those numbers as we get yep. into those sections, if you don't mind. But uh, and uh, and then the other one you say out of province. So is, are, we, are we talking staff that are training, or are we actually no, once they hit, ambulance? So once they hit the bridge to uh, to their location, wherever that may be, there, there's an additional fee that goes. That's correct. Okay, okay. Well, Larry Inverness? Uh, no, I guess that's probably it for now. I'll let some others uh, weigh in on the discussion. <laughs> sure, I'll tell you what's royalty. Thank you, Chair. Um, what is, is support for the mobile mental health units in this Medivy contract in this section? No, it's under mental health and addictions. Sure, I'll tell you what's royalty. So, so it's a totally different contract. It is a separate contract, yes. 
Charlottetown West Royalty. And would his supports for the PCH with with um, paramedics, is that in this area? That's within Health PEI. Charlottetown West Royalty. Um, the supports for the COVID swabbing in this section? Health PEI. Charlottetown West Royalty. Um, what What is Health PEI doing um, to help the EMTs out and not have um, offload delays. Is there anything that that you're doing, Minister, or how are you how are you addressing that? I know they are working on something, but I don't know exactly what. So we can bring that back. Charlottetown West Royalty. Okay, and this is a, this is a pretty big contract. Um, it's hard because like the contract is PC in different places, but um, we're I think I think we're trying to help you out here to to try to. To try to figure out how, how, how have we, Minister? In your opinion, has the department stressed or stress stretched um, our ambulance service providers by by getting them in too many different contracts? I don't uh, feel so, and uh, this is uh, my certainly my opinion, Member, as uh, Minister. Uh, you look over the last time period. Uh, the impact that uh, the sickness that COVID has had with regard to our paramedics. Uh, we've seen it right across uh, every sector, uh, every business that it has impacted. Uh, they, our paramedics, as I've said before, uh, do fantastic work. They are great partners. Uh, you've got uh, uh, mobile response, again, a great initiative and a great partnership there. Charlottetown West Royalty. Okay, I'll just move on to uh, um, so so in this section you have uh, s salaries. Uh, I see there's a jump of about um, uh, you know hundred thousand next year. What's that budgeting amount? We actually uh, had quite a few vacancies during the year, and we knew that going into last year. So we had some people we uh, budgeted in 21, 22 for part years. But we're actually back up to full complement, so it's a full year salary. Cheryl Town West Royalty. Oh, so that's one full year salary? Um, actually, it's two people for part years. Cheryl Town West Partners. Royalty. Part years. Oh, part years. Okay. Um, is your organ and tissue donation director um, there in the department? Is there somebody in that position? Yes. Charlie? Charlie Thomas Royalty. You're referring to the individual that we had met with uh, there a number of months ago, uh, honorable member? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I would have to check unless uh, Karen knows right off just what section that that salary She is in this section. Of. It is, okay. Mm -hmm. Charlie Thomas Royalty. So is she there in that job? Yes. Okay. Did, yeah? Charlie Thomas Royalty. <laughs> All right. Yes. They've said yes three times. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I got I, got, I thought I got conflicting information before. Um, so we talked about this before, organ and tissue donation, Minister. Um, you know there there is some there. Uh, you see a consultation amount in in the big budget book. Um, what is that funding for? That uh, I guess a follow up to uh, to the meetings that we have had, uh, member and. Uh, that uh, we're prepared to education, promotion, making Islanders aware of, uh, of the importance of organ and tissue culture donation, that that is one of the first steps as we move forward uh, and, and expand upon that. And, uh, you know, as we've worked together and certainly want to continue to work together with you on that, but that would be incorporated or included in this section. Charlotte, that was royalty. And, and we've we've had a conversation. We've had meetings about this. It's important to me, and I know it's important to, to you, Minister. Um, we might have differed on the way we're going to get get there. I mean, this time last year, I, I asked you on the floor, were you supportive of you know uh, a different different way of doing things? And since then, we've been working on it. Where is the department right now? I think that we're a little bit behind from where I thought we would be right now. Can you give me an update on what our province is doing to promote organ and tissue donation and when, when we can see legislation come forward? 
Well, again, I'd have to go back, uh, Chair, to the answer to my previous question. It's uh, the promotion aspect of it, uh, the uh, awareness campaign to Islanders. Uh, I could see uh, the look on uh, the member's face when he had asked about the individual that uh, that is in the department. Uh, and uh, Karen, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that she was at CPHO for a certain time period. That certainly had an impact, without a doubt. Uh, but uh, I agree with both yourself, myself, and obviously from the meetings that we had with the employee, uh, is, she is extremely passionate about this. Cheryl, how much royalty? Exactly. So she was out of that role for just a little bit. Um, and, and hopefully she's back. And I mean, there, there's some there's some key elements that, that we've worked on because I want to see this move forward in the province. So I mean, um, I'm, I'm looking at um, that number over here for 20, 2022-2023, $34,400. Can, can I get a breakdown of what that's going to be used for? And, and I need a promise that we'll meet very soon about to continue on our discussions. And just for a very uh, rapid follow-up on that, uh, I can't recall the date of the letter, but I had forwarded you a letter, uh, Honourable Member, I don't know, be maybe a month and a half, two ago, that outlined some of that information. But we'll certainly bring back uh, 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 the details uh, that you have asked for. Cheryl, I'm sure I'll give you one more question, and I can put you back on the list if you wish. That's good. That's good for right now. Thank okay. you, Chair. Mermaid Stratford. Great. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm going to just ask a question for potentially tomorrow because we're obviously going to be crossing different areas in which um, <coughs> Metabi Island EMS funding is going to be discussed. Would you be able to come back with a summary of all of the different um, payments in, in the budget of how we, uh, how we allocate those funds and uh, so that we can get a single picture of just how much is allocated? Health and wellness and health PEI. That would be wonderful. Yeah, because I'll be asking in health and wellness, so we might as well, or health PEI, so we might as well do it now. Mermaid Stratford. That would be great. I appreciate that. Um, so, is there any allocation um, within this to do consultation on the current contract with Island EMS in this upcoming year? Because I guess I'm assuming there is no negotiation that's going to happen the contract's going to go signed as of today this new year contract starts tomorrow but do you have consultation funding in here in order to do a full review of that contract there's no additional funds for consultation however if consultations are needed we will find the funds from within mermaid stratford Thank you, Chair. And I would think my, that when I, when I ask about consultation, I'm a, I, I think public needs to be involved in this because it's a, it's, I mean, it is life and death for Islanders, right? They should be involved in their care and what the level of services that they expect. So if, um, like, when we get that opportunity to have that discussion, Minister, I would really like to have a fulsome discussion as to what that contract negotiation should look like and how paramedics, students, islanders, and everybody can be part of it. I think that's fair. Um, Stratford. Thank you, Chair. And then just one final question. Uh, you said that you're going to bring back the number of ground transports, or sorry, off-island transports, mm -hmm. correct? Okay. And um, let me just go to the grant section for a second here. And you said that the the education bursaries, is that for Island EMS that's under the grant section, or um, is are those um, education bursaries for something else? They're education bursaries to go to students who are at the uh, program at Holland College. Mermaid Stratford. Ah. And how many students do we fund to go to the program at Holland College? Uh, we'll get to the exact number, but the uh, number, uh, my understanding is that in the class that is to graduate uh, this coming uh, April, that there is 18 in that class. But again, we'll get the exact numbers for you, member. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And, and it, I mean, it's only 24 
$6,000, but I mean, I know that we have one of the best programs and like, I know it's second to none, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, and people travel here from all over in order to attend it because Holland College does have such a phenomenal program. And I mean, the people that we graduate from that program are first class and I mean, when you speak to them, you know the passion of, you know, wanting to uh, remain in this profession. And so what I'm wondering is, like, in order, do you have educational, and it might have been under under the ministers, but, and I feel like this is where it gets difficult because Meta is a private company. And so if, if it was under health PEI, you could actually say, here's um, a return to service bonus if you take, if you sign on with us. Like, do you have that ability with it being under a private company to do a return to service initiative? Or is it really up to the private company to do it themselves? That, uh, Chair, is, uh, mm -hmm. is a very interesting question. Uh, I think that it is uh, something that regardless of whether Medivy would do this or not, it's something that uh, the province certainly could look at, at various options uh, when you say return for service. But uh, no, I appreciate you bringing that forward, and that's something that, uh, that we can certainly look into as a department. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair, because one of the challenges is when you speak to paramedics themselves, and they talk about the tenure of their colleagues, and their colleagues leave, you know, without being, they want to retire in the profession, but it's just not feasible for them. Anyway, and I mean, there's a lot of things that we can do with our public health care system that makes it super challenging when we source it out to a private company, right? And I think we're seeing the effects of that. And uh, anyway, I would just be interested in what you end up hearing from the paramedics, I understand you're talking to students, but there's a wide array of paramedics out there that have a whole lot to say, and I don't think it's their responsibility to um, come to you because there's safety in numbers if it's done on a different type of engagement basis, which is really hard for them to organize and still feel safe. Um, and I know that you say, I'll talk to anybody, but I really think that there's safety in numbers. And if there was a way for engagement to happen, for the prob for the, you to find out exactly what they're facing, because it's not the job that is making them leave. And I think that that needs to be shared. So if there is something in your department that you can initiate in order to um, give a, that safe space and allow them to come to you en masse, not one by one. Um, I think that you'll see very clear narratives that come out that don't necessarily stray from each other. They're pretty much the same. And I, so I think that it's important that they be given that space in order for them to give you feedback on the company that you keep auto renewing a contract for. And then that, that's all I have to say on that, I think. So the section carry? Community health programs, appropriations provided to support community health policies and programs, including but not limited to primary care, chronic disease management, women and gender diverse health and fertility supports. Professional services, 75,000, salaries, 395,400, grants, 620,000, total community health programs, 1,090,400. Charlottetown Belvedere. Uh, the difference between community health programs under this section and those that are under health PEI. I'm just looking at particularly at like women's health where it's, it's referenced in this section but there aren't actually any grants <laughs> for women's health in this section so I'm just wondering how, like, how, you, how you determine where they fall it would be really helpful. Actually, it's brand new this year, so we are still working out that because, yes, they are working with the women's health, but the women's health funding actually was added to the um, strategic initiatives budget this year. Right. So next year we may end up putting it in there. I, I, I will apologize. It's still a bit of a work in progress. Um, so this is programs right now. I think the programs that we have is some funding with the 
Best Start uh, program, as well as Peers, Peers Alliance. Alliance. Yep. Um, so things that are community outreach programs. Okay. And it, it is primary, primarily grants, but at the same time, it is policy work such as uh, supporting the medical, uh, the primary care roadmap and such, but it's the back end policy work on that. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate the clarification. I was trying to follow the, the breadcrumbs and, and mm -hmm. you know, see uh, community health from Health PEI is where we see some of those really big, mm -hmm. really big programs like, like the diabetes, yes. you know, um, health outreach and, mm -hmm. and the women's wellness programs. So mm -hmm. it was just sort of looking at, and, and, and I get that difference between mm -hmm. the, the direct delivery uh, versus sort of perhaps some more policy and strategic work, mm -hmm. um, but also a place where you can put things that maybe don't fit. <laughs> right? So, um, it, um, Chair, it's really, really great to see that that grant for Peers Alliance. Um, you know that I'm an advocate for for uh, sustainable funding for um, nonprofit organizations. Can you advise whether this is in fact like meant to be core funding or is it a pro project? Actually, in 21-22, we entered into a three-year funding agreement with them. Charlotte, help over there. <laughs> Music to my ears. Um, is, that, is that what this represents? Yes. That is so exciting. Um, thank you so much, Minister, for, for hearing that and for acting on that. I Honestly, I can't tell you, not, not just that it's a multi-year agreement, but it is a substantial multi-year agreement that will fundamentally make a difference to an organization that does such important work. I cannot tell you how um, thrilled I am. Uh, yeah, I, I honestly, just that's so important. Sure. Uh, if I could just get to that, uh, your emotions <laughs> speak volumes. So appreciate that. Yeah, it's um, on Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. It's an area that means a lot to, to me um, and to people that I love and um, really, really important. So um, really appreciate seeing that. You know, the the multi-year or um, funding for organizations means that they can do some of that more challenging, um, complex work in the community. Have there been any, re any requirements or requests with Peers Alliance about what they may be working on with your department, Minister? I'm sorry, I... That's okay, we're still, we're still in the crying about it phase. <laughs> Just take a moment. I uh, hate um, to, uh, to ask the member to have to repeat all of that, okay. but if, uh, if uh, the member sure. could, that would be helpful. Yeah, I wasn't prepared to, to do this, so we're both <laughs> in the same space. Um, can you advise um, whether... Um, what what you're at, what you're hoping to see from this kind of investment minister that would in terms of health outcomes uh, excellent question and I think uh, again you look at uh, Pierce Alliance or any NGO that we fund uh, there has to be uh, and I certainly appreciate the uh, the efforts that the member has put into not only peers but also other NGOs with regard to not just year-to-year -year funding but ongoing funding, uh, realizing though that yes, so these are taxpayers' dollars that there does have to be accountability. But with that, uh, from my perspective as the minister, uh, it's the experts, I will say, at peers in conjunction, working with the department, that uh, are the ones that have to identify what those outcomes are, and you know, uh, it, and in so many cases, it's not going to be an outcome that you will see overnight. It's going to be down the road. So I don't know if I've answered uh, the member's question, but Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. It's a reassuring answer, Minister, because it says that, that it's the, the relationship is the right way around. Um, and, and recognizing that that's part of the reason why we need multi-year funding for social justice organizations is that measurement of success looks very different when we're talking about impacting social change. And they're not necessarily they're very different from what we would see with, with investments from innovation or product delivery or something like that. So understanding that is, is a large part to how we 
we build trusted relationships. Um, and you know, those are those are challenging at the best of times, especially in, in, with this with a community like this, which which has not had a good experience of trusted relationships. It's it's really significant, um, and it sets a benchmark, which means you know we're just going to come back and ask for more, Minister. I'm sure you appreciate that. Um, in that vein, um, Chair, if I can ask about the other part of this grants piece, which is around the Best Start program, um, you know that I have raised this, and there was some definitely some concern and confusion, so I would really like to clarify that today, Chair. And it does mean I have to reference something we have discussed previously, but it is in context because the funding for Best Start is actually split across two departments. Is that okay with you, Chair? Yes. Thank you. Actually, I, I was not in the Chair the day you asked that question, and they did at that <coughs> time, and the Chair, the member from Charlottetown, we so at that time, did write a note here to say you were going to ask this question, so they were prepared. <laughs> so, so there are no excuses for not nope. being prepared. They're okay. well prepared. Thank you. I really appreciate that, and I would, I would like to extend my appreciation to the honourable member for for that that preparation. So, um, much appreciated. And and obviously the reason for this, the reason for me asking that, because I want to achieve, you know, what we want to do, and we're asking questions in this house, is we're doing our due diligence. We're we're working on behalf of the files that matter. These are not just numbers. This is about real people delivering real services with taxpayers' money, and it is our job to ask the questions that they bring to us or that our constituents bring to us, and that's what I am very pleased to be able to do. So the context, Minister, um, is that in the education line under uh, the early childhood development, there is 1.22 million that is an, a line item allocated for the best start um, workers' salaries. However, the actual administration of the Best Start program and the negotiation was, we were advised, moved to health. And in this section, there are two line items for two um, program pieces. So salaries have remained at this point, but the responsibility has not. Um, and the challenge is somewhat around Salaries, so it means that we have to talk about something that isn't technically in your department, but but Minister, I'm hoping that we can do so productively. <sighs> okay, so we have two line items. We have a family health clinic, which is an amazing project. It's $180,000 a year, and that's a funding line in this community health. And then we have the Best Start program itself of $190,000. I'm understanding from the briefing that we've been provided that those are the same numbers that we had in the year previous. So I'm not seeing any increase in those. And we were advised from education that there was no increase to the line item that they have in their department. All that to say, Minister, my question is, where is the salary increase for Best Start workers that we have been asking for since 2019? Uh, first of all, unless I am reading the booklet wrong, uh, uh, that there actually is under the Family Health Clinic an increase in budget this year of 40000 Am I correct on that, Karen? Yes, and there may have been a mistake in the handout that went out that the $40,000 increase may have gone to, shown as it was the, uh, the uh, Best Start Workers, it was actually a $40,000 over budget to the Family Health Clinic. Okay. Thank you. So it's 120 there. and 150. Sorry, could you repeat? Sorry, it's 120 for the clinic and 150 for uh, Best Start. Okay. So Thank the Best Start number has uh, not changed since the, since okay. the previous budget, but the clinic did get some additional funding. Okay. So if we could focus on the Best Start mm -hmm. workers a piece. So so I guess that the, the crux there, and I think we kind of. Yes, are, are, you are. Okay, great. So funding was added to health and wellness's budget to help with the increases in the salaries back in uh, 1920 yeah. of $150,000. But you are correct, that has not changed. Right. And we do not have additional funds in our budget right now. Um, however, we are willing to start the discussions with them. And I believe that we've actually already had some discussions about um, economic increases and other increases. And so hope we are hoping that when we do do the uh, contract for the 22-23 year that there will be something in there. I am aware that there is no additional funding for that, but if funding is uh, needed, we will hopefully be able to fund it from within or we'll come back to the House looking for a supplemental appropriation. Charlottetown Belvedere. 
Thank you. I, I appreciate that clarity. I, I really do. Um, obviously, my job is to then ask very clearly <laughs> what, what I would hope you would consider. Um, I am actually hopeful that that salary line will, will move over to health too. Right? If the, we recognize this is a health program. However, the professionals who are almost entirely women who deliver this program, this, best, this essential program but, uh, as, as Best Start workers, and I don't know if you've met any of them yet, Minister, um, but these are women who work with vulnerable babies and their, and their mothers. Um, up to 50% of children in the province who are born every year are referred to the Best Start program. So vulnerable can look like a lot of different things. And I'm going to tell you, Minister, I and my daughter were in the Best Start program because I was a single parent with no support network and Best Start was the, was the reason that my, I and my daughter had a solid foundation um, as with me as a completely clueless new parent and with a preemie daughter who had failure to thrive. It was my Best Start worker that identified that when no other, no other person did. She saved our lives. And I have a very, very um, obviously personal reason, but then I then served on the board of Chances for four years because I believed so much in the work that they did, they and they do. And I can tell you from my first-hand experience and as a professional and as a woman and as a mother and as somebody who knows how important that early intervention is in our community, that this program literally saves lives. And Minister, with all of that in mind, even if I had had nothing ever to do with this program, I would still fight for it. Because this is a perfect example of how such a small investment is solving a problem that nobody would see unless it wasn't there. And then we would absolutely know about how this would impact us. You know, we have more studies than we could ever need about the power of intervention at that earliest age, at those most critical years. And that's what Best Start does. It's zero to three. And it changes the direction of lives of, of children in this province forever. These women, primarily women who deliver this program, who are these workers, are, have been assessed independently as at the equivalent of early childhood educators. But they're not just early childhood educators, they're healthcare workers. So we need to pay them appropriately because what's happening is they're having to leave that industry, they're having to leave those incredible meaningful jobs because they can't earn a living. If they're only earning 15 bucks an hour to save people's lives, they can't earn a living. And they're leaving to go and work in jobs that are honoring their, what they do and what their qualifications are and paying them five bucks an hour more. And honestly, like, we can't afford to lose those people. We just can't. And they love their work, and they love their clients, and they love what they do. And Minister, you need to pay them, please. So I'm asking you, from all of that, I'm asking you to honour the commitment that your government made in 2019. I'm asking you to do everything you can. And if you bring a special warrant to this floor, I will stand up and applaud, and I will vote with every vote that I can get for it to say, yes, we should pay them, please. The chair, certainly appreciate uh, uh, the honourable member's passion uh, as she spoke to this. As uh, her passion was evident when she gave me uh, one of a few accolades, I think that she's probably given me, but uh, write write them down. which makes it even <laughs> makes me appreciate it even we'll, more. We'll hug it out later. We'll hug it okay. out. Okay. <laughs> we wear a mask. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, I do appreciate uh, where the member is coming from, and uh, uh, certainly, uh, you know, we could have a lengthy discussion here today, which may not be uh, conducive to the overall budget process. Uh, with that uh, member, I would be more than happy to have uh, a discussion and also to meet with uh, some of, uh, of the workers. So I'll put that in there. Charlotte, I'm over there. Thank you. And that's all I ask. You know, I understand. You know, I, I'm not in a position to get you to, but I am in a position to ask you to listen. Um, and I know that you will, because you just said so. Um, so, so perhaps, yes, we'll, if we will leave it there. Um, and, and um, Minister, I would be very happy to 
continue this conversation off the floor and to continue to advocate for, you know, as I have done for many other things. Um, as you know, I don't give up, I don't go away, I don't stop asking, and this is one I will continue to be in your ear about this um, because, because it, this is the right thing to do. So thank you for your time on this, Chair. Thank you very much for your indulgence of allowing us to kind of work through that one, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Minister. Cheryl Town, Victoria Park. Chair, um, just looking at the the two hundred thousand dollar overspend in salaries, and I'm just wondering um, what those positions were, and if if they were any new programs. As I had indicated when I had first started talking to the previous member, this is a new section, and so we were still just getting started. So we ended up um, hiring staff earlier than we had anticipated. So these, the new salaries were primarily for the primary care roadmap support and to be able to assist with those areas. Charlotte and Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And so um, there's a, a $50,000 overspend on grants would that be kind of the same the same thing for last year yes so what that is is actually forty thousand dollars of that fifty thousand was to um, the uh, chances um, family clinic um, their expenditures were more than what we had originally budgeted for so we had increased their spending appropriately and then the other was for another grant for I believe Physio program, rural physiotherapy. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, and thank you. I'm gonna just kind of echo what um, the member from Charlottetown Belvedere talked about. Those those programs, those two programs, are so important. So I, I appreciate you know allowing that, understanding that costs are going to go over and so kind of being flexible there and I, I hope that that is something that you always practice with them um, with anyone really um, and so there's so this is a line for um, women and gender diverse health and so I'm just wondering there's a, the grant for peers alliance for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and I'm just wondering if that is if, the, if there's any other programs where we might see the the clinic Because it was a beginning and it was still a strategic initiative at the time that we prepared the budget, budget the funding for the Women in Diverse Islander strategy and uh, the first year work with that is actually in the strategic initiatives budget at this point in time. And uh, most likely as we move on with that, it will end up uh, being in this area. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And so that all of the questions that we may have relating to the Women and Gender Diverse Islanders health strategy would be in that Yes. Section. Okay. And the strategy has not yet been released, so. Do we have any idea when that will be? I know that's not in this section, but such. Uh, such. Chair? Sure. Uh, no, sorry, no, yes? Certainly uh, a great question. Uh, my understanding, and I have posed that uh, as well, Charlotte and Victoria Park, uh, uh, it will be later this spring, is what I have been assured. Charlotte and Victoria Park? Thank you, Chair. I really look forward to, to that. Um, I'm okay for now. Thank you. So the section carry. Total community health and policy thirty-four million three hundred seventy-eight thousand. Shall I carry? Health workforce planning and pharmacy, health recruitment and retention, appropriations provided for recruitment and, retrench, and retention strategies for physicians, nurses, and other healthcare professionals. Administration 53,800, equipment 5,000, material supplies and services 52,500, professional services 289,500, salary 728,700, travel and training 8,800, grants 2,781,500, total health recruitment and retention 3,919,800. O'Leary Inverness. Uh, grants. I'm assuming that 2.7 uh, million there is is that uh, money a grant to the PEI Medical Society for the for their their efforts in recruiting and retention. Uh, there would be uh, a number of different uh, recipients to those grants. Uh, uh, okay, uh, so and like I say, a number of uh, different ones. I think it might be uh, if. Uh, 
we could bring back the exact information. I could take a number of minutes here and get through them, but uh, it's, yeah. Actually, if you go to page six of our handouts in the big book, okay. it indicates what most of it was used for. Okay. Yeah. And it will say various, and the reason why is because it was to individual people. Right. So it breaks down between physician visits that were paying for physicians to come, okay. uh, a relocation allowance, return and service agreements, incentive programs, healthcare futures, bachelor of nursing, family medicine sponsorship, paramedicine program, um, more return and service agreements, uh, contribution to the school of nursing. So that's what that funding's for, and it's outlined in the W6. Oh, Larry, Inver oh, sorry. Minister? Uh, just yes. uh, reiterate, health care futures is there. Good. Uh, that's good to know, too. That's in the <laughs> grant section. Oh, Larry Inverness? Yes. So under salaries, then, so how many people do you have under uh, the recruiting and retention section? 728,000, because that's quite an increase from last year and what was estimated. So, so is that... Uh, uh, and, and who's who's in that? Eight eight positions. Eight, eight positions. FTEs. Oh, Larry Inverness. And is there who's kind of the head of that section now? I remember it was Sheila McLean in my time, but just. Uh, yeah, Rebecca Gill. Rebecca oh, Larry Gill. Inverness. Rebecca Gill. Okay. And are you feeling that you're getting good value for your money there in that? As far as uh, like I say, as we see. Numbers seem to be a lot of vacancies, and we're not catching up. I mean, what, what's mm -hmm. your thoughts as a minister on that? Uh, I feel that uh, the workers, the employees in this section do a fantastic job. I know some of and under difficult circumstances. And when I say that, uh, I mean in particular just with regard to uh, uh, the pandemic, the limitations that that has put on travel and face-to-face -face meetings and the like. And uh, yes, uh, I think that uh, they have done a fantastic job. Uh, you look at uh, the number of nursing students, for example, that were brought in last year. And, you know, we've had the discussion uh, outside the rail uh, uh, member of uh, just the importance of recruitment, but also retention. But I'll leave it at that, Jess. They do a, uh, a top-notch job. Oh, Larry Inverness. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not arguing that the, they're not uh, making every effort to try to do their very best, but but it just seems like the numbers keep getting bigger and bigger. Like I, like I say, I remember in my time, it was like 20 nurses we were trying to recruit for. Now, I think the last Monday, it was 131 on the external list there. So. Uh, you know, so maybe you could shed some light on their, their strategy. Are they looking after going after maybe Alberta? Because there was some time there that Alberta was going to shed some nurses out of its system. Uh, is that where we're heading? Is there, or are we going to other countries? If, do you have any indication of what the strategy is as a department to uh, try to recruit and fill for, for a multitude of health professional vacancies? Well, certainly a part of that uh, is under uh, grants. You look at the incentives that uh, have been put in place that have been uh, uh, increased uh, over the last three-year period, whether it's for uh, RN graduates, for whether it's for nurse practitioners, you know, uh, across the board. And as, uh, as a member fully realizes from his uh, time in the chair, that uh, we're not the only jurisdiction yeah. that is having these challenges. We are, to a certain extent, in competition. But uh, uh, when you say with regard to the strategy, uh, there's certainly a number of initiatives there. Uh, but, uh, honorable member, I would be happy to go back to Rebecca and get you know exactly what uh, initiatives that, uh, you know, I could sit here for 15, 20 minutes and I don't know if it would be the best use of, of our time, to be honest. I think Rebecca, being the one that works in it day in and day out, will certainly go back and bring that back, mm. member. Olary and Vernas. See, from my perspective is, is that, once again, as I look at the numbers, and I do watch them quite closely, and as, as I'm sure you do too, once again, we, still, we seem to continue to see these numbers, you know, more vacancies, uh, more islanders without a family doctor. 
I, I would be happy to see if, if it meant that a, another million dollars into this budget made a, made a difference or uh, would uh, recruit a few more or another staff recruiter would make a difference. I would be wholeheartedly supportive of indicating uh, that. Um, and, I, and I totally I, I understand the, how competitive a marketplace is, but as a government, you, you say you're going to fill these positions and it's going to attract more people, but at, at some point in time, we've got to see the results go at least the other way to get back to where you were when you took over. I mean, so, so that's where I try to come from uh, in, uh, in challenging as the government to say, you know, what's the strategy? And I really would be curious to see if there is a certain uh, area that you're trying to recruit to. Uh, you know, if I look at the issues of uh, graduating nurses, we're probably going to get the vast majority of them anyway. There are, a lot of them are islanders and they're wanting to get into the system. But I admit that you don't get them all. And, and uh, but uh, so that's kind of a, that's the low hanging fruit. It's where, where are we going after to deal with, uh, if I say physicians, are there other English speaking countries out there or French speaking countries that we can uh, try to attract some physicians from? You know, it's, it's just about how do we get their numbers to where we need them to be at least a little more closer to uh, meeting the needs. Um, one of the new positions, actually, that is not yet filled, but will be filled as soon as the budget is approved, is actually of an internationally educated nurses navigator to help uh, recruit internationally educated nurses. Okay. Well, that, and, that, 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 that's, and that that sounds like that would be an initiative that could pay some dividends, too, because, once again, you're right in saying it's a pretty competitive marketplace. And now, one of the challenges we always have with interna any internationally trained is that to get their licenses approved. And that becomes another whole challenge because you as a minister, you can't take a license and you can't uh, grant a license, you know, as I've, I've known in my time. And uh, so That's you need right. to be... Some of your colleges. Yeah, yeah. So you have to be uh, try to work with them as best you can to make sure that we're at least recruiting people that might have the potential. I don't doubt for a moment you'll have all kinds of people want, wanting to come here, but are uh, their credentials going to be validated and... Uh, are we going to get physicians that are, you know, meet the standards that we set in Prince Edward Island or in Canada, for that matter? So, so I, I would be curious to hear a little bit of a, a, a direction where they're heading. But that that position sounds uh, worthy and worthy of at least uh, giving it a shot, anyway. So I commend you in that, Minister. So I think that would be my questions for now. Thanks, uh, Chair. Mermaid Stratford. Hey, thanks, Chair. And um, I would share exactly what uh, O'Leary Inverness, I'd share that same thought. I think it's great to hear that you have somebody that you're looking to do international recruiting. Um, I think that that is excellent. But we also know that we've got a lot of health, um, trained health um, care pro like uh, providers here that have come and have not been able to get their license. So that's a really big issue. I don't know how you fix that, because I believe it's also a federal issue, issue too. Or and so, is there initiatives that that all first ministers are working on in order to figure out how you can capitalize? Well, not capitalize, but you know, like take advantage of people who want to move here and immigrate here and also work here in their field. No, I uh, appreciate the comments. Uh, it's also uh, uh, working with the individual colleges as well, like mm -hmm. uh, for example, the College of Nursing. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. I'm just going to put my earphone in there again. Um, so I wanted to just touch on a couple of things. So um, one, I'm talking to my own ear. Um, one of the areas, so retention. Um, retention is a really <coughs> crucial part of our health, health uh, human resource plan. Um, and I'm not sure how we're measuring improvement, right? Like, I mean, it, our exit strategies still, um, our exit strategies happening within um, health PEI, and I know that would be under the health PEI section, but in order to do actual um, retention, you have to know why people are leaving. So is that an initiative that you support? And if you support it, will you ensure that exit surveys happen for all healthcare professionals that leave health PEI? Well, uh, Chair, uh, absolutely. Uh, what can you say? Retention, it is under health PEI, and we can certainly have that discussion 
uh, then. Uh, but very briefly, Chair, I would say I agree that just uh, recruitment and retention to a large extent go hand in hand, that uh, uh, with regard to the retention end of it, exit surveys, exit surveys uh, have to be, the opportunity has to be provided to every uh, physician, nurse, employee that leaves health PEI. Uh, we're not going to, you can't force an individual to do it, but I agree 100%. That opportunity has to be made available and has to be available. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And that's an interesting comment. You can't force them to do it, but actually when employees leave a company, there are steps that go through in order to release them from the company. There's paperwork that has to be filed and all those different things. Now, they don't have to provide the information by all means, but giving access to each and every person at, that, at the end of their employment, um, you'd be surprised at how many people are very interested in filling out that document when they're leaving. Um, especially if they didn't have the ability to share that information while they were still working with the company. And I have to say, like, we learned a lot through the, um, the Garth Waite report. And so I'd asked about a human resource strategy out of the department. Do you have an actual resource, human resource strategy that you can table? We're actually working on one, and it's actually covered off in the next section. Um, Mermaid Stratford. Okay. So for the, um, for the return in service, so we spent $397,333 last year, or forecast for 2020, 21-22, and we're forecasting 400000 this year. So is that the same number of people that, like, is there a cap on that program as to how many people that you'll accept into that return for service? section no no and if we need Definitely to we will not. move money around yeah. you there has to be a budget uh, line on their uh, member and I do appreciate where you're coming from but uh, no if uh, we have vacancies and we hit that and see if we're going to exceed it uh, I'll sure that the dollars will be made available Mermaid Stratford. Okay, thanks. And so um, that is to bring in experienced RN, um, registered nurses and nurse practitioners. Does it also cover off RCWs and LPNs? Are they eligible for a return to service? Not to the best of my knowledge. Not to the best of my knowledge, no. It's only RNs. Okay. Charlotte, I'm uh, sorry, Mermaid Stratford. Okay, potentially something that we can look at given the shortage is straight across the board. Um, I, I'm interested in, you might tell me it's in the next section or where it goes. I truthfully don't know where it goes. But I'm interested in our residency program. So we have five spaces. And Dr. O'Connor had a really interesting guest opinion piece in the paper around our residency program and highlighted even if we have um, a school of medicine, we still only have five residency spots, and we have twice as many, um, twice as many people apply for those spots than what we can actually accept. So, is there a plan for the department to increase yes. residency spaces? Okay. I don't remember. That's, that'll come up in health PEI. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's tricky, right? Which is where, <laughs> just when you're on a roll and you're asking a good question, then you just go, that's in another section. Oh, but we let you go almost to the end. Oh, <laughs> I so appreciate that. You're welcome. Okay, remember start from? Yeah, so um, on the exit surveys, will that be part of your human resource um, strategy? Oh, I guess what I would have to say on that uh, member, and I uh, do appreciate uh, you bringing this forward, but uh, for, I would anticipate, yes, it would be and will be, but uh, with that, uh, the strategy, as uh, Karen has alluded to, is in development, and I guess I will have to wait and see. I shouldn't say I guess. I will wait and see what, uh, when I see the draft of that, and provide my feedback and comments, but I do appreciate where uh, you're coming from, member, okay. with regard to exit surveys. 
Thank Reed you. Stratford. And just one more question. Do you have a timeline on that strategy? We've begun work on it. Um, it's my understanding that it's to be completed within this fiscal year. I do not know exactly when. Okay. Uh, Chair, if we can get uh, a firmer timeline mm -hmm. on that, uh, yeah. we certainly will and bring it back, member. Thank you. Where we one, Stafford? I promise sure. this is yeah. the last one. Um, when was the last time one was done? I could. I don't have that information. We can bring that. Uh, yeah. It was the Hayes report in 2010, I believe. Okay. But we'll get that sure. uh, information and bring it back. Okay. Okay. Sure. Okay. What's your team? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so we talk about, just to, to pick up on, on retention, uh, Minister, um, what, I know it's as a strategy and we are just talking about it, but what, what are you doing, what are your goals as a minister to retain people, to value employees that work in this field? What is, what are your, what are your, how do you do that? I think there's a number of different uh, aspects, but uh, I would say that uh, you suggest that being that retention is under health PEI, that uh, it would be more appropriate when we get into the health PEI budget and look at the initiatives that, uh, that are there. Charles, I want to throw to you. Okay, so when we're, t when we're talking about ret uh, just kind of, I'm confused, like with the health BI thing. But you know, you look at it here. It says five hundred thousand dollars retention initiatives, um, five hundred thousand dollars. What what's that breakdown for? Like, what are we? Uh, we can bring that. You're speaking, uh, honorable member, specifically with regard to the five hundred thousand. Yes. Okay, we'll bring back an exact breakdown on the expenditure on that. Charlotte, sure, what's royalty? Well. Is there any idea, because we just said we're going to talk about it in health PEI, but there's there's half a million dollars in here. That's recruitment. Can't get... No, it's not. Oh, it's, okay. My apologies. Sorry. Oh, sorry. My apologies. Um, and this is, again, gets into the intricacies of them working back and forth. Health PEI is actually developing some retention uh, initiatives. We're working with them, and when they come through, we will actually reimburse them for the initiatives. So it, it, it the money is kind of... They, because it's their staff, they're working on the initiatives with some input from the department, but we are holding the budget on it, and they will bill us for the initiatives. Cheryl Thomas Royalty. So then what are the goals of that strategy? The goals of its retention, yes. Cheryl Thomas Royalty. But there has to be something more. If you're paying, if the taxpayers are paying for that, and all we see is $500,000 in here, I just need more information to see where that, what, what they're going to do with that money. And that's a fair question, and we will uh, bring back whatever information we can on that yeah. member. Charles, how much royalty? And the reason why I ask it is because this is the this is the big game. What I'm hearing, what I'm hearing from people who work in the system, is that recruitment is one thing, and then people are saying, "Oh, all these all these people are getting recruited with big bonuses." But I've been working in the system for 25 years, and I haven't got anything. And and now they've worked through COVID, they've they've come back out of retirement, and and they're they're lost. Mm -hmm. um, they've given they've given they've been exhausted, and I just want to know: Are we are we making like? And we see programs across PEI like like the COVID Warrior Pit. And I talked about it with people over there. It's just simple things to say, hey, you know what? You worked hard during the last two years to keep Islanders safe. Yeah. And I, I just, uh, I think, chair. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, no, and I do appreciate where you're coming from, uh, Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, I hear the very same comments. Uh, what I would have to say is, yes, we can bring back. But there are initiatives that, uh, that I, as minister, and working with health PEI and also staff sure. within the department. Uh, you mentioned uh, the COVID warrior. Uh, yes, sometimes uh, it doesn't have to be a massive. It's to show 
that appreciation, uh, but at the same time to look at other things that we can do. I've heard the very same thing, uh, Honourable Member, with regard, and we do have to have recruitment incentives. We have to be as much as possible competitive. Yeah. But I've also heard the same as you have, that uh, I've uh, worked, I've dedicated uh, 10, 15 years of my life, basically, and you have that yeah. that concern, yeah, and I hear it as well. Yeah. So I do appreciate where you're coming from, and where those individuals, where those workers are coming from as well. Cheryl Thomas Rowland. Yeah, it's great to have that discussion. It's great to have it because it's, it's 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 important. Um, so it, here it says when we don't talk about it enough, we always talk about doctors and nurses. But I think some of the we're, we're running we're, we're the allied health professionals, and I mean it touches on here. Um, other healthcare professionals, and and I mean I don't know. I think we should we should list those out in this document, like to make sure that that they see their names in here. But what what are the other what 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 are the other professions that you're 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 talking about in here, and what are we doing for to recruit them, and where are our gaps? Mm -hmm. uh, excellent question. I'll ask uh, uh, Karen to. Uh, uh, step in here, but uh, you look at uh, some of the things like the, the partnerships that I have talked about previously with regard, for example, Holland College and the increase in uh, the intakes there with regard to uh, the LPN program, those types of things. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, with regard to allied health professionals, I think that uh, we have talked extensively with regard to recruitment of physicians and nurses, and rightfully so, mm -hmm. rightfully so. Uh, but we have to uh, realize that there's the importance and recognize that importance of the other workers that keep the system going day in, day out. Karen, I don't know if you any need to put in those bones. <laughs> I was going to say, in regards to the um, allied health professionals, the, we did actually launch um, a psychologist initiative program in July of 2021, and we provide a financial incentive of $15,000 to eligible psychologists in exchange for a two-year return and service commitment. Sure. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. That uh, has been very successful. We have recruited uh, substantially there. Charlottetown West Royalty. So it was, and that's where we're incredibly lacking. So you launched that program. How many psychologists did we get? I think right now that uh, we should bring that back. Uh, I could give you a number, but I want to make sure uh, that it is exact. Charlottetown West Royalty. And what that was one example. It's a, other healthcare professionals. Um, what are what else is in your book there? Like, do we have anything else besides psychologists? That is the only one that I have highlighted at this point. Cheryl Town West Royalty. That, that's it? That's the only one for the uh, allied health workers. Cheryl Town West Royalty. So I think you could ask my next question <laughs> for me. But are we doing enough? And if that's it, are, are we, we're not, are, are we top heavy here? Are we not recruiting throughout the system? Uh, Chair, I would have to say, are, are we top heavy? No. Are we doing enough? Uh, I think that we can, you know, we can always do more uh, with the realization that there are limitations there as well. And when I say limitations, uh, you've heard me speak over the last uh, few days with regard to uh, initiatives in say the western and eastern part of the province, that uh, training uh, needs to be available when possible and if possible in other areas. And I think, you know, it's a, it's a broader s discussion, I guess I would have to say, uh, member, but uh, you look, yes, uh, at, at the initiative, certainly the psychology one, the recruitment uh, incentive there of 15,000 has paid benefits, and uh, if it speaks to one thing, that these incentives do work. Charlottetown West Royalty? They definitely do, but I'm, I'm thinking more, Minister, along the, like occupational therapists and physiotherapists and, you know, 
uh, all, all kind. We can go down the list of people outside of doc. I mean, when I say top heavy, I meant like if we're only looking at doctors and nurses, we're not top heavy. We don't have enough of them. But are we are we falling out in the other areas and kinesiologists and and people that are actually serving? Are we are we there? Uh, do, do we need a recruit, uh, recruitment and retention plan for those professionals as well? So again, in the next section, we're actually going to talk about our health human resources plan, and that's actually going to be um, a universal plan. So instead of just being a doctor plan, it's actually going to be about the entire system and health human resources. So we'll take those uh, other resources into consideration. Charlottetown West Royalty. Okay, so that would be the next plan, but yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Well, I mean, I might ask some questions there, but I'm, I'm a little bit, a little bit worried. But um, I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to skip to that because I'm taking up too much time. The UPEI Medical School Business Plan, two hundred thousand um, dollars under. That's in the next section. That's, that's in the next plan. Charles, how much royalty? Okay. Um, how many? Do we have to do any extra health recruiting for the medical homes? And has that been a consideration in this section? Are we going to need more people when the medical homes get created? And how are you recruiting for those? Uh, are we going to need more uh, people? Uh, I think that uh, you will cross uh, the board, uh, Honorable Member. But yes, we're, we have vacancies. We're going to need more people. But with regard to medical homes, the one thing that I would say uh, is that uh, you look at the College of Family Physicians, for example, of Canada, uh, College of Family Physicians of Prince Edward Island. We talk about retention. We talk about recruitment. But this is a, a concept, and that may not be uh, the best word, but I'll use it, a concept, a reality that is endorsed by both uh, the Canadian College and the Provincial College, and that uh, feel that it is going to uh, enhance not only uh, the recruitment, but the retention, and also to be able to provide uh, to Islanders the best service, the most appropriate service, in the best location. Cheryl, how much royalty? You just, you just said that the medical homes neighborhoods will enhance the recruitment of those professionals. How, Minister? What I am saying is that the experts, the colleges, say that there are tremendous benefits to this, and I'm not gonna, I'm not going to dispute what our physicians tell us. Charlottetown West Royalty. All we know is they're bricks and mortar. We know we need to staff them. And I'm asking you how many staff we need for those, what's our plan, and I, I don't, are we going to need more? Are we going to need more? Uh, I think that we have to be careful when we talk about, uh, and I'm, I'll be honest, Chair, I'm not sure just exactly how this fits in, but I'll expand on it to a certain extent. Um, that uh, we think bricks and mortar, yes, you require bricks and mortar for offices, uh, for patients. Yeah. But at the end of the day, what is most important is that you have the staff there. Uh, you look at uh, medical homes. It's not to say that, okay, this medical home and this one, and this one, and this one, are all going to be the same. And not to say that this one is going to be the same three years down the road as what it is right now. I think that we always have to be open to, uh, to innovation, to improvements, and again, to provide the, the best quality of care in the best setting and to work collaboratively like we've uh, uh, talked uh, yourself and I uh, uh, remember with regard to mental health, with regard to addictions, and that that collaborative, that working together is, uh, is so important and it's important for Islanders too, but it's also important for those who are delivering the service. Sure, I'll tell uh, Well, last question on this. So, I guess why I'm asking about this now is because something major changing, wh wh whatever that is and whatever this side of this government's decided to do, it's coming. 
and I'm asking under health recruitment and retention because there's almost four million dollars in there and how much of that pot is going to recruit people for those medical neighborhoods and I guess that's that would be my question how many uh, to say exactly there's nothing specifically allocated yeah. for recruiting to those particular positions. Um, they would be part of our regular recruitment uh, of physicians as well as nurses and other positions. Cheryl Thomas Royalty. I'll pass the floor. Thanks, Chair. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the relocation fund. Um, so my understanding is it's paid. Uh, it's a really real. Sorry, relocation uh, allowance for mostly physicians. Is there any allowance for nurse practitioners, LPNs, RNs? Is there allowances for them if they're coming from off island? Um, I'd have to check on that. I'm not sure. Okay. Mermaid Stratford? It would be great if you could because, I mean, we know that we're in as much need for um, those positions as we are, you know, for others. And um, the cost to relocate here for the job is, you know, is quite a bit. I've loaded up a U-Haul van before. It's not a, it's not a cheap thing endeavor to do. Um, and, he, and so I just wanted to point out that if they're not included in that relocation allocation, we probably should look at some sort of program so that we can assist it, it to encourage people to come move here. And then there's one other thing, and I know this, I just want to put this beat like this out there. Another thing with RNs, my understanding is when they come from off island, they don't take their seniority with them. And I, so I don't know how you can, um, like for instance, I have a constituent who went from Halifax to Saskatchewan, and they counted all of her time as time served. But when you come here, then those, that time, those years of service aren't actually included. So potentially that is um, a barrier to recruit if they can't take, you know, some, their years of service with them and have them acknowledged here in the province. So when you're working on your human resource strategy, I would suggest that if you want to remove another barrier, um, looking at that years of service or some sort of re reward, but it means that they can't get vacation time. They can't apply for certain for certain um, positions, and and it becomes a, a hindrance. And I think that that impacts our recruitment once once they realize how challenging that'll be there be for them. So I just wanted to share that as something that you, you probably should look at as well. Okay. Thank you. I'm great. Thanks, Chair. Leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I know things are going to change over here. I'm sure the minister has to leave and open one of these uh, medical homes. Today is March 31st. You doing, you doing <laughs> ribbon cutting this afternoon? Open it. Or anyway, my question is, we're under retention, so I just, minister, you talk when you're asked a question. Everybody has the same problem across the country. Okay. What are you doing to keep people here? Can you give us a night look? What are you doing to make people happy that they're staying here? When we hear that somebody's offered double time and a half or you need somebody to do a shift after they work 16 hours, people are pretty tired. So, like, so you can't get people, but you have another recourse. What are you doing to keep the people that are here to stay where they're supposed to stay? Fair question. So, uh, for example, uh, health and wellness, they have been working with Health PEI on a staged multi-year plan to, in relation to retention, mentorship, training, yearly fund, <clears throat> excuse me, and in the meantime, Health PEI has began implementing a variety of wellness supports and training opportunities. So, for example, uh, Just Culture is one example. I uh, could bring back uh, some of the other initiatives that are, uh, are being worked on and are in place as well, uh, Honorable Member. Leader of the Third Party. Hey, Minister, you made mention here the other day that the, the paramedics that are taking the course at Holland College, nine of them are going to stay or are going to 
work for Medivy. Then you said 13. There's 18 altogether. Why isn't there a converted effort that you go after all of them to stay and you work with EMS to up their wages? Like you say, mm -hmm. one hand you're you're saying it's EMS's responsibility, but then another hand you're involved in it. Mm -hmm. So why aren't you just working together to have all of those 18 stay here and pay them accordingly, so they stay here? Mm -hmm. Uh, again, uh, thank uh, the leader of uh, the third party for your question. Uh, I think that uh, when we debated uh, the motion here yesterday, one of the things that uh, I had discussed was with regard to collective agreements, and uh, I won't go down that road again. Uh, you mentioned uh, some uh, figures there. You said nine. I don't recall that I had ever indicated, but I could have nine. Uh, my indication was that there are 11 that have given a commitment, but that doesn't mean that there's not the some of the other ones that uh, uh, that may be providing uh, a commitment uh, leader. Uh, I think two we have to realize and we have to look. Okay, some all of the, the ones that are taking their pair medicine here are not necessarily from Prince Edward Island. So they may, for whatever reason, want to go back to their home community, and that's outside of our control. Uh, when I talked about the 13, uh, that was with regard to, and again, as I understand, two paramedics that have moved here from outside of PEI that uh, are being interviewed by Medipi Island EMS. Um, Honorable members, this concludes the uh, government time for today. Okay. It again. Shall I carry? Speaker, as chair of the committee of the whole house, having under consideration the grant of supply to Her Majesty, I beg to leave the report. The committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move the report of the committee be adopted. Chuck Carey. The Honorable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the opposition, House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I call motion 107. Should I carry? Carry. Mr. Speaker, motion 107, calling on government to improve and move towards public paramedicine, is currently under debate, and debate was adjourned by the honorable member from Morel, or from Morel Donut. The Honourable Member from Morale Dona and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think I uh, made my uh, comments uh, yesterday uh, with regards to this motion. Uh, I'll just summar uh, summarize uh, uh, briefly what I had been speaking about. Um, when this motion uh, had appeared, I spoke to two paramedics, and uh, they had thought that moving directly to, uh, to a public service may be premature. Um, Mr. Speaker, they they want us uh, to, you know, focus more on the issues at hand right now, uh, which for them were were the working conditions. I had mentioned about you know, not being able to take vacation and and you know uh, you know being called in and, and uh, not enough uh, staff, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the wages were uh, an incredibly big one, Mr. Speaker, but being brought up to their you know, to at least to what other uh, paramedics are making in, in the other provinces. Uh, Mr. Speaker, accountability and, and transparency of data were the other things that they had uh, said that they wanted uh, to focus on. 
Um, you know, I think that, as I had mentioned uh, yesterday, I think the department should always have that option of, of uh, bringing it into the public service uh, as an option, but, uh, you know, uh, committing to, to making, uh, bringing this into the public service uh, right now is not something that I'm prepared to support at, at this time, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member from O'Leary, Inverness, and the third party web. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, obviously as a member for O'Leary Inverness that has raised numerous questions uh, in this legislature regarding uh, some of the response times. I think it was mentioned a few times, you know, how long does it take to get from Hunter River to Cape Wolf? Uh, the reason I chose Cape Wolf, because it's probably the farthest west location within my district, Mr. Speaker, but it, it does sort of summarize uh, the reality of what we're dealing with. and. Uh, you know, I've, I've uh, had the opportunity as a minister to see one side of this uh, equation. I've uh, uh, seen ambulances come to our home, or my parents' home, I should say, at the time when they were alive. Uh, I've uh, talked to paramedics, and uh, I, like many members in the House here, we always we have our, a couple of our favorite paramedics that are constituents that seem to be always sending us our, our uh, situations and updates, so there's no secrets anymore about uh, the level of service, Mr. Speaker. But uh, you know, so I have a number of factors that I want to look at, and I raised uh, I raised the issue just on the floor with, on the minister with his estimates. You know, when it comes to response times, and uh, you know what, how uh, how response times are uh, uh, informing the public, and how we look at them. And like I said uh, during my time as a minister, it was kind of the first one of the things that I would have on my desk. And I know as a minister, there's a pile of things in your desk from every subject imaginable when it comes to health care. But I always would try to make sure that I had a good look at the uh, response times. And I, not that I did, wasn't concerned about the cross the island by any means, Mr. Speaker, but I would in particular always look at the O'Leary zone. And, uh, you know, in the O'Leary zone, there are four ambulances that are based out of that particular zone, Mr. Speaker. And I certainly commend how awesome all our paramedics are. These are, uh, that these are first responders that are, you know, on very troubled situations that people are at probably in their worst situation that they could be in in their lives and uh, they have to professionally uh, deal with uh, these situations and I uh, would argue that they do it in a very professional manner and uh, they are well trained to uh, handle those uh, situations Mr. Speaker. But like I said in the floor of the estimates you know there's I guess we're trying to determine how much money that, that Island EMS actually gets and it seems like it's in the 14, 15, 16 million range and, uh, you know, I, I think uh, we have to uh, make sure that we are getting value for our money back. I guess the question ultimately comes based on this motion, is public paramedicine better than, than the company that is able to provide it, that uh, has, uh, has experiences in other provinces, uh, and we also see, look at other provinces, although every province might have a little more particular version of how they deliver ambulance services in their region. I think we have to look at something that uh, makes sense for Prince Edward Island. We, we are a bit unique in the respect that we are in a very diverse uh, geographical area. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't have, we have a very bizarre setup for our municipalities. I know some, some uh, versions where there's public paramedicine, uh, it usually stems a little more around uh, our uh, uh, municipalities, the bigger centers that may have firefighters and, and uh, paramedics all, all in the same, uh, same avenue, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, but I think we've got to think about what's happened over the last while, Mr. Speaker. Even from my time, you know, we've, uh, you know, we have about 11,000 calls that these uh, people have to respond to. Uh, that's doubled since, uh, you know, uh, 2007, Mr. Speaker. It's, it's a significant increase. Now, I would argue that public policy will determine a little bit about how many re recalls we're going to get. I think of our time when, uh, when we were in government, we provided seniors with, uh, for emergencies, uh, free ambulances. That spiked the amount of calls. Just a reality of what we deal with, Mr. Speaker. So I would say that, you know, government can influence the amount of calls that we get just by the policies that it's going to implement. Uh, we talked earlier in the floor with the estimates that, the, you know, for for non-seniors, there's still a there's still a fee of $150 for an ambulance uh, call, and uh, so how we want to determine that. I, I know I think the minister, he wasn't quite certain of the amount, but I, I would say that that 150 might be 10% of the actual cost of operating a call 
if you take it over a period of time. So it's a significant amount. So I mean, we certainly can influence uh, as public uh, uh, people to how uh, this happens. Uh, one of the things that it was kind of an interesting when I became minister. You know, I, I was trying to figure out how our ambulance system, I kind of assumed that there would be situations where every uh, jurisdiction sort of was part of the, a public paramedicine process. And in fact, it's not. And in fact, it's, uh, there, our ambulance system is not even under the Canada Health Act. It's sort of a separate entity. It's a delivery of a service that could be private. It could be many different versions of how it's delivered. So, and I, and I recall uh, at some of our uh, ministers' meetings, that what happens if an islander got hurt in another jurisdiction, they, they go with the assumptions it's going to be the same as here. Uh, but yet, they might get a ra rather surprisingly large bill from the uh, ambulance system in another province. And I remember there was somebody, I think they were traveling out west, and there was a bad car accident or something, and uh, I think it was in Manitoba, and they got hit with a pretty substantial bill. And they didn't have insurance for it, and there was a number of factors. I think it was another call I had one time. I think somebody was over shopping at the uh, Moncton Mall and slipped and fell, <laughs> wound up they had called an ambulance and thought they were a senior, thought they were going to get a free, free trip to the to the hospital, and, and lo and behold, they got a fairly hefty bill. So, so I think that's something maybe we have to make sure that we're informing people that. This is not part of the Canada Health Act. It's not part of the system that we expect for a, a delivery of service. Whether it should be or not, that's another argument and debate, but I would hope that we would, that would be something that all provinces would sort of do something that's a fairly uniform uh, uh, situation. Uh, if I look at, uh, you know, just the O'Leary zone, which I mentioned earlier that the response times has increased quite dramatically. Uh, you know, it, it's really ranged over the last year from an 11 minute response time to a 19 minute response time. And every, lots of people say, well, they never get here in 19 minutes. No, I, I get that. But there is a version of a formula that's created. We can argue whether the formula is right, wrong, whether they take the highs and the lows out of it and come up with an average. Uh, but it is, it is still an indicator of whether our response times are going up or down. And. Uh, you know, with that, and I looked at uh, at the O'Leary numbers in the in the last quarter. You know, they had 223 calls on average, and uh, you know, in Prince Edward Island, you're looking at 40 4,200 calls on average uh, for all in the last quarter, and uh, you know that that's something that uh, has to be. Uh, you know, it, there is a volume here, and these people are doing a lot of work. So there's seven ambulance zones on Prince Edward Island, and. Uh, you know, it's, it's some, one of those things that uh, we have zones for a reason. And uh, this is something that I, I'll say I'm criticizing government and island EMS at the moment. So if we have four ambulances based in O'Leary, we're hoping that's going to look after all the levels of service that the residents of the O'Leary zone would require. So that includes transfers, it includes, uh, you know, emergency calls, and it, it's, a, it's a journey from, say, the O'Leary Depot, which is locas located on Willow Street in O'Leary, it's pretty rare that you'll ever see an ambulance sitting in that location. <laughs> and uh, we come with that expectation that there's going to be, you know, uh, at least one ambulance within that region. But unfortunately, the, the only ambulance available might be in Hunter River if we're lucky. And today, there was none available at all. And, uh, you know, that leaves Islanders very vulnerable. It leaves Islanders in a state that uh, if something did happen unexpectedly, that they may not be able to uh, respond. And when I talk to paramedics, where their dissatisfaction is, is that they're trained to provide emergency services in a sudden, a certain situation. <clears throat> and if their response times are an hour, which is not uncommon by any means, <laughs> Their, their chances of having a successful outcome on somebody that might have taken a heart attack or whatever is, is, is lower. And like any person, we want to be successful when we arrive. We want to have a good news story, you know. Uh, we don't want to have a, a person that is in a chronic state that the chances of success, uh, a successful outcome are unlikely. And that really puts a lot of pressure on our paramedics. On top of that, Mr. Speaker, when I say when we talk about an ambulance at one location, if it's only in Hunter River, and I did get, create quite a stir in my district when you know I took a picture of an ambulance in Hunter River, and uh, but that was fact, Mr. Speaker, that was an ambulance that was in Hunter River, and it, and like I say, if there had been a call in Cape Wolf, that uh, was a pretty, and I thought it was actually the only ambulance that was. Uh, 
in, on, uh, from Charlottetown to North Cape. And then I find out a little later, no, that was the only ambulance on Prince Edward Island. <laughs> so, so when you have four, five, six ambulances that are off island, uh, taking people to uh, different locations, and that comes from a number of factors too. And I know the Premier made a statement that they're going to try to collaborate more with, uh, with uh, other provinces and providing medical services. It's a large budget item. Uh, off island medical services I think is probably the second largest budget item uh, for healthcare delivery. So if we're going to do more of that, we're going to have to have an ambulance services that, that's going to be able to accommodate that. This government seemed to have no plan for, for these types of uh, equations that are coming forward here, Mr. Speaker. The minister will say that there's, well, I've heard him say nine more uh, uh, paramedics coming into the system, or there's, uh, or there's 11 more. We're not sure the exact number here at the moment, and that's fair. I don't expect the minister to know all, all these numbers specifically. but. Uh, that's probably the next time we're going to get a chance at another eight or nine till next year, Mr. Speaker. And that's, so it's not uncommon that we get a, a, a bunch of uh, paramedics and, and that those numbers sound pretty good today, but they don't sound so good come December uh, when waiting for the next batch to come. And uh, unfortunately, if we can't uh, hire all the graduates or hire a significant number as a pool of potential paramedics, then all of a sudden they're taken up by other places or they go take a job in another jurisdiction and the chances of getting them back are, are not real uh, successful, Mr. Speaker. I know we talked a lot here about contracts with Island EMS and uh, I've met with them numerous times as a minister, uh, although not part of a specific uh, negotiation. We certainly would uh, uh, talk about uh, services that we could advance and services that we thought we could have. And I remember signing the contract regarding our island EMS uh, paramedics being able to deliver some palliative care services in homes. And, uh, you know, it was a case where if there was a paramedic that was available on a call late at night, they could, they could go in and check on a, a, to deal with maybe a pain management issue because their home care nurses might not be able to get, be there and through the night and things of that nature. And I will say that that was a, you know, a generally a, a successful uh, uh, process. Uh, another thing I was involved with, Mr. Speaker, during my time as minister was uh, a paramedical school for advanced care paramedics at uh, UPEI, Mr. Speaker. And I want to give a shout out to Dr. Trevor Jane for uh, his efforts in getting that school up and running. But that school's been running for a while, Mr. Speaker, and we're still not caught up. In fact, we're going behind in the amount of uh, paramedics that we have that uh, are available uh, for, uh, to, to do the work that uh, is required. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things that need to, need to happen here. Uh, I have concerns about making it a public system. Uh, I've had numerous conversations with uh, a number of paramedics from my district. Uh, I will say in general, they're not supportive of this. That leads me to believe, as, a, as their elected representative, I have a hard time supporting this motion. Uh, but I'm not saying it's not a worthy motion and not worthy of discussion. I think it's a, I commend the, you know, the opposition parties here for bringing something like this to have discussion and have some input by all of us here, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think that is is worthy, and. Uh, you know, I, I think of the situation, I know there's an upcoming meeting of the uh, O'Leary Hospital uh, regarding, uh, you know, usually they have an annual meeting with the Hospital Foundation of some of the issues that they brought forward. I know we've had the minister uh, for meetings uh, about a year ago, and one of, the, one of the issues that I'd started a bit when I was minister was about the situation at the, uh, with Island EMS and their depot at Willow Street in O'Leary. The, the building is... Uh, somewhat dilapidated. It's not to the standard that I think that our paramedics would like to have uh, when they have a chance to, uh, to be at a depot. And uh, I am proposing, or, and I think the foundation would be doing the same thing as proposing that we uh, try to uh, re re relocate that depot at, to have it actually on the site of the hospital. And uh, although we don't have uh, emergency rooms at the O'Leary Hospital, no different than in Surrey, uh, we do have uh, acute care services as well as uh, long-term care services there. So having the depot at that location may, uh, may be a good opportunity to provide extra coverage to the people that are already there and it allows those paramedics to work with health professionals in a, in a very collaborative approach or in that, at the same particular site and uh, may be able to uh, be a, a worthy lo location. But it means that you know, the government has to come up with the capital cost to do some renovations, to do a, do a proper job. 
I understand at the O'Leary Hospital that they are looking for uh, other services. They need more space. So here's a chance to sort of, as the old saying, kill two birds with one stone by uh, investing in uh, upgrading the island EMS. And what we could do in that particular case, Mr. Speaker, is that the province would own the building and the province would uh, lease it out to uh, the space out to island EMS and collect a, a rent for that or take off uh, the 14 or $15 million that we're given. them. You can make that work very easily, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I think those are the type of innovative uh, ideas that I think uh, <clears throat> government needs to look at, along with the volunteers uh, at our hospital foundations and the management staff at the hospital. So, so I think there's lots of uh, arguments that I think could be used to make our system better. But I, I guess ultimately I tend to say that I think, I think it's premature to be uh, talking about a public system. I think uh, it's good to have the discussion. Uh, my certainly feedback from the, the paramedics that reside in my district are uh, saying that the issue is we're not, we don't have an issue with Island DMS. We just want the contract to be followed through. We want to make sure we have a, you know, the proper staffing in each, uh, each uh, van or truck. Uh, way too often, one, one person alone in the truck, just not appropriate, Mr. Speaker. Uh, not safe, not safe for the paramedics and uh, not delivering the level of service that we're, we're supposed to be getting for the amount of money, <clears throat> the millions of dollars that we're handing over to this company. So although I tend to be very critical of government, <laughs> and uh, I appreciate what the, what the opposition parties are trying to do with a motion like this, I, I have a hard time supporting the motion as it's worded here now, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, and it really starts out with the issue of calling on government to improve and move towards a public paramedicine system. And as a caucus, I know we've discussed this and thought about ways of trying to soften it or amend it. And I guess uh, my part is I don't feel, I feel at this point in time, I'm not opposed to the idea, but at this point in time, I don't think we're ready for it. And I have a hard time supporting the motion as uh, worded here, Mr. Speaker. And I do not, uh, I'm not gonna be amending it in any regard. So, so from that, so from that, Mr. Speaker, I guess I've made it pretty clear my views on this particular and how I would vote, and uh, I'll uh, cede the floor to another speaker on the motion, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I really didn't think I'd get to speak today, but anyway. oh, thank you, Honourable yes. Member. Um, I guess uh, this this motion is a great motion, and I too just wanted to add my voice to it. Uh, we all know these paramedics are wonderful individuals. They live in our communities. They work in our communities. They're volunteers in our communities. They do a great job. If this was to be put under the public service or changed in any way, we see what the government has done to them already. They're providing a company. A company's trying to provide a service. The government keeps dumping more responsibilities on them and dumping more responsibilities on them. They have them running around. They had them doing home care. They had them doing the mobile mental health. Like, there's only so many of them. They got sick during COVID. People needed time off. Like, it's no wonder that we're, we're getting the service we're getting. Government keeps piling stuff on. So imagine if government had them under their umbrella. Holy smokes. Anyway, transfers. Why isn't, there a, why isn't there a delegated group to transfer people in the province? Uh, did anybody think, now they laugh at us when we make suggestions, I'll make another one, let them laugh at me. Hire a driver to drive the ambulance and have one person with the patient. Why do you need two paramedics if you're short? Like, have a driver. Great idea. Instead of having a, a unit sitting empty at the depot because they got nobody to drive them or go pick people up. Like, you know, there's so many things that it's not... EMS is all their fault. It's certainly not the workers' fault. Now, the minister talked 18, 11, 13, 9. Like, it's the same as the budget. We get different figures on everything. Like, they can't even tell us how many beds are available or how many are empty. Same. Like, same old, same old stuff. Same. But then they criticize us for us, us and the official opposition for doing our job well, we and do. try to keep them to account. Like, come on. Like, and when they were over here, and I'll say this You're until right. the cows come home, they knew how to do everything. Yeah. And they did lots of heckling. And now they're over there and they're starting to heckle again. And, but, but they're doing everything different. Oh well, yeah, they're doing everything different, all right. They make sure they're doing what they want to do. And you know, I was taken to St. John New Brunswick and there's people that go to Halifax every day. Those EMS personnel 
are the most dedicated mm -hmm. and care about their jobs and about us more than anybody I know in this province. But when they're taking me over to St. John and there's an emergency and nobody can go to it, they don't feel good about that. Who would? I wouldn't. They're stressed. They're doing the best they can. But it seems like this government is, put, is doing everything they can to make it a little bit more difficult. And then when we come up with an idea, oh, no, 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 no. Anyway, I don't have a whole lot to say other than that. But I will, I will say this is not a bad motion, but I just can't support it because of the last clause. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of good things in here, but as far as it, it being a parameticized I, I, service, I can't support that. So that's all I want to say, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the time. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty and Third Party House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I just wanted to stand up to to support um, the paramedics and and, and 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 what they're talking about this. You know, I, it's interesting if, if any of you have been around maybe two paramedics that come in different different uh, vehicles and they're talking up. I've had the opportunity to do that. And it's so interesting because it's like another language. They're talking of another language, different codes, different, different. They have their own brother or sisterhood. It is a very tight-knit group. It, it, it's something interesting to watch, and they care deeply about servicing islanders across the province. We might have made mistakes in overburdening them with, with their jobs by doing things like COVID swabbing, the mobile mental health unit clinics, setting those things up, and the coverage at, at PCH. What, what, where did we go wrong that we had to take them out of the work that they do to cover off um, elements of our system mistakes? And, you know, th these, are, these are hardworking Islanders that will stop at nothing to make sure that Islanders are safe. And I, I can't imagine what it's like to know that you hear the calls come in and you can't get there. Or you, you, you're, you're, you're so far away and you need to get there. This is the stress that's causing them to burn out. And I've been hearing it for a long time now, almost hearing it so that um, when we're in talking to people, the, the information that I just heard one day and I was just hearing in the afternoon, they didn't match up. And I, I couldn't figure it out. And you kind of question yourself. But we're listening and, and, and we hear you and we, we, hear, we hear you out there and want to make this, this a good place to work. And I, I don't know, I don't know if, if we're looking at it the right way. We have an aging population, we have an increasing population. There is more demand um, for the, the good services that, that, that ambulance providers do and the paramedics do. And we want, want to make sure that you're valued, you're definitely heard, um, and, and, and we talk about this more than you know. But, but government has to get busy finding a way to fix this, finding a way to, to look at the contracts that, that are signed and dedicated, we just talked about it today, and do something about it. It's within your hands. But I'm not sure bringing it in and being a government employee is the right answer to that. But, I want to make sure that government feels this pain about making sure that, hey, they're stressed out. There's a certain demographic that is working for Islanders, and you've got to fix this, and you've got to make sure those, 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 um, that contract and, and what they're doing is there, and that we have enough people. So when, when we look at this, when we look at this, and I hear it all the time, that you couldn't be doing anything more, and we understand why you're burnt out, and we understand what that, what that, we, we hear you and the wages and the conditions and what you're doing is, is putting you at a situation that you will burn out faster in life and your careers than you should. Hear you, understand you, and we will stand over here and make sure that government's accountable for that. Just not sure, and what I'm hearing too is just not sure is putting it into the public system is the, is the right thing to do at this time. Other than that, um, I'm glad I had the opportunity to speak. And thanks for reaching out to me, and uh, I'll cede the floor, Mr. Speaker. Honourable members, I exhausted my list. Is there any? Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I don't often get up to speak to 
motions, but I, I do. I know, and and after hearing the leader of the third party speak, I felt compelled to, to speak, and he's and he's right. He's he's very right. When we were over there, we did have all, all the answers, and and uh, perhaps uh, in some cases it's not as easy as uh, as we thought it was. Now you have a different advantage. You came from here over there. You should know that beforehand. But <coughs> what I will say is this, Mr. Speaker, and, and it was funny because I, I I have friends that. Are that uh, work for Island EMS, they, they drive ambulances. I've spoken to a number of them over the past number of weeks. People have been reaching out to me, and I've had a number of conversations and I've heard a number of stories. <clears throat> and I got looking back through the, the transcripts, Mr. Speaker, and you'd be happy to know I found your name in relation to, to this issue. And this was, I, I remember back in. 2014, quite similar questions were being being asked on the floor, and at that time, I had learned a lot about how the whole ambulance system worked. <clears throat> um, not unlike how the whole proceedings are, are unfolding today, where we, we did through <clears throat> some through research, some from hearing from drivers, and some from going right out to Island EMS and meeting with them and trying to figure out what the issues were of the day. <clears throat> um, what I can say is that, you know, I'm probably re really fortunate where I, I live <clears throat> um, because the Georgetown Fire Department, our first responder fire department, and, the, and their jurisdiction is, <clears throat> is very small. And from, I don't live in Georgetown, but I do live in Burnt Point. And from my house to the, to the fire station driving is just like a matter of, of minutes. And I've seen them in action. <clears throat> um, one night in the winter back in, I'm going to say, it was 2014 or 2015, some, it might have been the winter of 2014, 2015, <clears throat> I was driving in, into Georgetown in the evening, and I'm not sure if I was perhaps going to the rink to play hockey or, or something, but <clears throat> I noticed an object on the road as I came in into the community. And as I got closer, I just moved, moved over to Swerve, and as I went by, I realized it was a, per, a person. On the road, so I <clears throat> jammed on the brakes and got out. Other people came along, and a call was made to 911. And I'll tell you that the fire department in Georgetown was there in a matter of seconds, had the paddles out, revived this man. I still see him walking the the streets today. And, I, and actually, Mr. Speaker, during the last election, he sat in my uh, in my campaign office and pointed out everybody that was coming to the poll because the poll was across the street because he knew every car because that's. He spent so much time watching the cars. So <clears throat> it just goes to show you some of the other people who might be involved in, in the system. And I know if you go over to the Cardigan Fire Department, a number of the members over the years have been uh, ha worked for Island e EMS as paramedics, and they've had a great advantage of have, being able to have some of those people on the trucks um, as volunteers when they're not work working their shifts, and they're very fortunate for that. <clears throat> And I, I guess as, as far as the motion goes, like I'm very sincerely, I, I think the, I think that the honourable member is very sincere in, in her approach, and deserves a lot of credit for the work she's, that she's done. And obviously, if she's able to gather information, there's a, a level of trust that's out there with people. And I think that's, you know, I think that's an important thing when <clears throat> you get to the point in politics where people are willing to tell you stuff because they trust you, then, you know, that's probably a really high watermark for um, how people view you. I think that's, so I think that's a very important thing that I want to point out. I don't, I, I don't think I support, support the motion, but not because I don't want to see things fixed. I'm just not convinced that it, as a public service, that I think that's the, the best place for it. Uh, I, I, I don't think you'd find anybody over here who would say, let's not fix this. Like, uh, I think we're very sincerely people, and, and I know the things that I've been told, and I know the people who I've talked to, and uh, you know, I'm not going to repeat their, their stories because they were told to be in trust, but I think that <clears throat> I, uh, I very much want to help the people who have come to me have uh, better results, the, the, the results that they're looking for in, in their daily jobs. So <clears throat> uh, I think this is a great motion. I think it's been a great debate. 
I don't think I can support the motion, but <clears throat> that doesn't mean I don't support the work that the honorable member has done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, honorable members, I exhausted my list. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? If not, I'll go to the mover of the motion to close debate, the honorable member from Mermaid Stratford and the opposition house leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank everybody who has spoken to this motion, who has stayed and listened to everything that um, has been said in this house. I want to um, thank the paramedics who I know are tuning in and as well here. Um, I know that you have to be in a pretty serious situation in order to reach out um, to the extent that they are. And I, um, I thank the honorable uh, member for pointing out that it does take a, a huge amount of trust to reach out and to share things that you know could put you in a very precarious position. And I appreciate and I hold that dear because I know that um, I'm very fortunate that, um, that that is the case. So I want to share with you what I've heard directly from paramedics. And it's not just one or two, it is a whole network that are trying to improve <coughs> the system for, PE, for all Islanders. And it's not because, you know, they need better health care, it's because they know their families live in live on this province, in this province, and they want to ensure that their friends and their neighbors um, all get the care that they so much want to give. Um, they love their job. They love going to their job. They love, um, they love caring for the islanders that are behind those doors when they arrive. They love their colleagues. I've never seen such a group of um, colleagues that just depend on each other so much and rely on each other so much and hold each other to such regard. Um, and Mr. Speaker, they want to retire doing what they love, but many of them find it hard to see that, to envision that, especially with the state of um, the environment today. The only thing that every paramedic that has reached out to me has said that they don't love, Mr. Speaker, is that they, how they are being treated by the employer. It's the unfair wages. It's the inability to get vacation time. It's the rejection of using their bank time. Frankly, it's the blatant lies that are in the media because when they are not supported in the media, when they arrive at people's homes, it's them who are public facing and have to deal with the concern of the family members that are there. I've also had a paramedic arrive at my home and uh, when my dad was at the worst and I got to see what it looked like in that back hallway at the hospital. I've never seen anything like it. Five ambulances sitting there and their hands are tied because they know calls are coming in and they can't respond. Um, this, the extreme overtime, gosh, like, you know, we heard in the media, will give you double time. Some are being offered, offered triple time to take the overtime. But then they also know that they're missing the time with their families. They're missing birthday parties. They can't go to the hockey games. They can't go see the concerts. Because they're there to serve Islanders. And they're doing it every single day, every single one of them. And we have the best paramedics here in this province. And I just want, and my colleagues just want, to see them treated better. And to get the respect that they de deserve in their workplace. It's been mentioned a couple times in this debate that making paramedicine public on PEI won't solve the problem. And that's right, Mr. Speaker. It won't solve the problem because there's no easy fix to the problem. It has taken us years to get into this mess and it will take us years to get out of it. What public paramedicine will allow us to do is take back control of the situation and start the work to improve our paramedics 
uh, our paramedic services for both paramedics and Islanders in general. Public paramedicine would mean that we, the people who represent Islanders, could work directly with paramedics without the middleman. And we can decide what is best for all Islanders. That's what we're elected to do. We could ensure our paramedics are treated fairly and with the respect that they deserve. As opposition, we hold this government to account if they, do, if they don't do this. But that is not easy to do under a private system. Mr. Speaker, this is why Canadians, as Canadians, we unanimously love our public health care system. It is our pride and joy. We talk about it all over the world. Does it have to be, it, it does have its own issues, of course it does. But public means accountability. Public means fair treatment. Public means that you are entitled to the same health care and safety if you live downtown Charlottetown or if you live in Tignish. We just need to look south of the border to see how unfair and un-Canadian private health care truly is. The official opposition believes in public health care, Mr. Speaker, and all that it stands for. We believe that Islanders deserve emergency, primary, and preventative care regardless of where we live. Can this be accomplished by a private provider? Yes, but the reality is, under MediV, it's not. And it is too important for us to turn a blind eye and not work to fix it. The minister sp stood in the House and, and talked about we all should get the health care regardless of where we live. But the reality is it's not happening right now. I want to remind the minister that just last week my colleague from Tignish Palmer Road shared a message from a widow who confirmed that that's not the case. This does matter. It matters to paramedics. It matters to Islanders, and it matters to me. And I really do hope that we get support on this motion. I'm sure we don't know how it's going to work right now, but that's why we're calling for a strategic plan to get us there that engages paramedics so that we can see what their day is like and what they need. I've heard from lots of paramedics, Mr. Speaker, that are in favor of moving it to private. I've heard from a lot of retired paramedics who say, at 45 years old, I should be in those trucks, but I can't be. And that's not their choice. There's a term that they've told me, which is called Medivy refugees, which means that they are out of um, working in the career that they loved long before their time. They don't choose to leave the province. They want to work in this, in this health care system. But it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a place that they can be, and they have to leave. And I'll be frank, you can't have any other choice to work as a paramedic in this province unless you work for Medivy. It's your only option. You can't even come from another province and maintain your license because the legislation gives Medivy the monopoly, and we allow that. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm hearing loud and clear from paramedics that they need something systematically different, not just an auto renewal of a contract that the minister can't even speak to on many clauses. They need us to go through it. They need us to care about what's written in that contract because they know every day when they're in the field that if they do not have the support of us and the province, it makes it extremely difficult for them to do the jobs that is so difficult to do. I challenge any one of us in this room to be as brave as those people are that are out there answering those 911 calls every single day. It's easy for us to sit in here and say, oh, I don't think it'll work. But we're not listening to them. We, speaking to students is not telling you what the lived experience of paramedics is. You're never going to retain paramedics if you don't actually believe and if you don't actually take the, take the initiative to go out and talk to them because that's who matters in this situation. 
because they need our support to be able to go out and take care of our families and our neighbours and our kids and everybody every single day because that's what they do. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I won't stop until I see changes to ensure that they are supported and that they get the change that they desperately need so that they can go to work and live a healthy life and do what they need to do every single day because we're depending on them. And I thank every single paramedic that is out there that is working so hard and working through this and sticking with us and hoping that finally this will be the time that there will be change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable members, there was requested for a standing vote. Sergeant Arms, you may ring the bell. Honourable members, those voting against the motion, please stand. The member for Cornwall Meadowbank, the Minister of Fisheries and Communities, the member for Moraldona, the Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier, the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action, the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, the member for Charlottetown Winslow, the member for Montague Kilmuir, the Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning, the Minister of Agriculture and Land and Minister of Justice and Public Safety, the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, the Minister of Health and Wellness, the member for Charlottetown West Royalty, the leader of the third party, the member for O'Leary Inverness, and the member for Tignish Palmer Road. All those voting for the motion, please stand. The Leader of the Official Opposition, Member for Summerside Wilmot, the Member for Mermaid Stratford, the Member for Charlottetown Victoria Park, the Member for Charlottetown Belvedere, the Member for Charlottetown Brighton, the Member for Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, and the Member for Se Summerside South Drive. Honorable Member, your motion is defeated. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I ask that Motion 103 be now read. Shut up, Carey. Motion 103. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford moves, seconded by the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Victoria Park, the following motion. Whereas endometriosis is a condition in which endometrium tissue similar to what normally lines the uterus grows outside the uterus. And whereas symptoms of endometriosis include debilitating period pain, painful ovulation, chronic fatigue and pain during and after intercourse. And whereas it is estimated that one in 10 women, trans and gender diverse people worldwide have endometriosis. And whereas on average it takes seven years to correctly diagnose endometriosis. And whereas there is no known cure, however, symptoms can be managed through ex excision surgery. And whereas long waits for diagnosis, misdiagnosis, and disbelief of symptoms se severity often lead to poor mental health 
of individuals struggling with this disease. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to conduct awareness and education campaigns highlighting the prevalence and impacts of endometriosis for both healthcare practitioners and the general public. Therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to create guidelines for diagnosing endometriosis. And therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to compile a list of resources and treatments available to those who are diagnosed with endometriosis on PEI. And therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to improve data collection on endometriosis and enhance support for Islanders with endometriosis to participate in clinical trials. The Honourable Member from Mermaid, Stafford, the Opposition House Leader, will start the debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, endometriosis was not something I knew anything about prior to the election of 2019. And I think we all have stories of somebody who comes and speaks to us during that campaign to tell us what our needs are. And I'm bringing this motion forward because of a very, very brave woman who lives in my district. And um, I like to call her a friend. I never knew her before. She sat on my couch and she told me all about her, her, her um, story with endometriosis. And we cried. And I couldn't believe that that's the way that some women are treated within our healthcare system. So, Mr. Speaker, I committed at that point in time that if I was elected, that I would bring forward endometriosis in the Legislative Assembly and I would look for better supports. And that's why I stand here today. But, Mr. Speaker, I wouldn't be able to stand here today without the story of my constituent. And with her permission, I'm going to share with you her story, her 26-year ordeal of trying to get diagnosed with endometriosis. Her name is Pam McDonald. And these are her words. I first had symptoms of endometriosis when I was 13. Perhaps even before then, as I always had a sore stomach as a kid, and no amount of testing ever gave an answer as to why it was happening. I got my period when I was 13. I was excited at the time, but that excitement quickly turned to dread. I would bleed for weeks on end. The never-ending bleeding was made worse by the fact that I did not have access to menstrual hygiene products. Throughout my adolescent years, the excessive and prolonged bleeding continued, and as the years went by, my pain increased. I, work up, I worked up the courage to talk to a male doctor about, um, about this when I was 17 years old. He put me on hormonal contraception, contraception. I didn't like the way that it made me feel, so I stopped. By the time I was in university, I was vomiting and occasionally blacking out from the pain. After complaining about the pain a number of times, my doctor um, gave me a drug called Vioxx. Um, this drug was removed from the market in 2004 due to the increased risk, risk of heart attack and stroke, and there were several, several class action suits um, associated with it. Once that option was exhausted, we tried hormonal, hormonal contraception again. This time, a different brand. I didn't like the way that, it, that I felt while using it, um, so I did not stay on it. Throughout my 20s, I was on no less than four different types of hormonal contraception. And by my late 20s, although my pain wasn't actually that bad due to taking these meds, I was bleeding all the time despite taking the hormones. This seemed concerning to me, but every time I brought it up with my doctor, I was told I was fine. It was normal. By the time I turned 30, my pain started to return. I stopped taking the hormones because they no longer helped to mask my symptoms. The bleeding got worse. The pain was back in blackout levels. Still, my doctor was all, said all this was normal, and when I asked for referrals to a gynecologist, I was given a host of reasons of why I didn't need to see one. Oh, they're too busy to see you. The wait list is too long. What if I send you and someone with cancer um, may, not, um, may not be on the list and you took their place? Excuses after excuses after excuses. Finally, I started going to the women's health clinic. I knew the doctor there was a woman, and although she wasn't a gynecologist, she obviously dealt with this kind of thing on a regular basis. I told her what I, what was, going on, uh, what I was going through. She agreed that I was probably in pain, but she didn't have any symptom, uh, any solutions for it. My pain was reaching levels where I wasn't sure how much longer I would be able to get out of bed in the morning. I had developed medical trauma, 
so going to the doctor was a panic-inducing event. My disease remained unchecked for 26 years. Because of that, much of the damage that has been done is now permanent. It wasn't give, I wasn't, sorry, I wasn't given the opportunity to have children. This disease robbed me of that. It robbed me. <laughs> sorry, Mr. Speaker. It robbed me of my plans to further my education and to live my life to its fullest. Mr. Speaker, Pam would be here today, but I'm happy to say that she had her surgery on Thursday. 26 years she was waiting. And last week I had the opportunity to talk to her, her physician who was doing the excision um, surgery, which is the gold standard, and which is really, I believe, only available in Toronto. And it took 26 years for her to get there because she wasn't believed. Um, she was told pelvic pain is normal. She was told blacking out due to pain. Nothing wrong with that. I wholly disagree with that. After 26 years of pain, long time bleeding, nausea, messed up digestive system, and the sadness that comes with nobody believing you um, to do anything, that anything will help, Pam had her surgery. And Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to say that she looked phenomenal. However, she did lose a lot of her reproduction system and it had, the endometriosis had invaded many of her organs and it had gone up into her lungs. Um, the physician, Dr. Lemos, um, I heard from him, he's in Brazil right now doing more endometriosis surgeries. But one thing that Dr. Lemos told us is the treatment that we use for endometriosis in this country is from the 80s. He's never seen anything like it. Um, she was 26 years trying to get diagnosed. Mr. Speaker, we have up to 9,000 women in this province that have some level of endometriosis. One in 10 women have endometriosis. But yet, we don't talk to girls when they're in high school, or sorry, in junior high school when they start their periods that this could be something that they experience. We don't have enough education for our primary health care givers so that they can figure out the symptoms and whether it might match. And we certainly don't have the treatment here. We don't have the expertise here to be able to look at, um, at ultrasounds to see if they can see the uh, endometriosis. You have to be specially trained for that. We don't have that. And Mr. Speaker, we certainly don't have the surgical ability to do it here. But what we need to ensure is that all women know what, serve, what they have access to. Um, there are very few, um, very few have had opportunity, those that with endometriosis, to have real endometriosis specialists um, to talk to or even learn about the disease that robs them of so much of their lives. We need to start taking pelvic pain seriously. We need young girls to know that pain during their period is not normal. We need to talk about the symptoms. We need to inform patients of all possible treatments and the limitations and consequences of each option. Patients should be fu fully informed and able to make decisions that are best for their health. Both family doctors and specialists in all fields need to have a basic working knowledge of this disease in order to serve their patients. And we need to acknowledge that that's not the case today, and that's okay. We can make that change. We can make a difference. And Mr. Speaker, I thank Pam for um, bringing this to my attention. And she now works with, um, with the endometriosis, endometriosis um, Canadian Network, working on a federal plan of how they can treat this countrywide because it is serious. And unfortunately, many provinces don't know enough about it. So we need a federal plan that's set up in order for, um, for women that are suffering with endometri endometriosis to get treatment because, Mr. Speaker, it's not okay. It's not okay for us to not know about it. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I look forward to continuing the debate and hearing people from all sides um, 
Thank you. And the second of the motion, the honorable member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I want to thank the honorable member for bringing this motion forward. It's um, a really important topic. Um, I had the pleasure of joining the honorable member in her meeting with um, Dr. Lemos and Philip Philippa Bridge Cook, who is from Endometriosis Canada, and I learned a lot from that brief meeting. Um, as mentioned, Dr. Lemos is an expert in endometriosis care at the Women's College Hospital in Toronto. He comes to us from Brazil, who has the best endocare in the world, along with Argentina, Chile, France, Italy, and Spain. He specializes in pelvic pain, pelvic floor dysfunction, pelvic organ prolapse, endometriosis, and neuropelvology. Dr. Lemos tells us that when it comes to endometriosis care in Canada, Canada is archaic, that we are completely stuck in the 80s. And this presents enormous challenges for women ident identifying people seeking care in Atlantic Canada in particular. He spoke to us about billing systems and how billing systems dictate practice. In a fee-for-service system, if you have something complex, you're in trouble. In our system, low complexity, high volume is what is ideal. So if you're having issues like this and you're a woman, your health outcomes are just not a priority. They're not understood. The more specialized a healthcare professional gets, the less money they make. This used to be. I will remember the hour has been called. Adjourn, adjourn debate. With that, I will adjourn debate, seconded by the member from Mermaid Stratford. Sure, Carrie. Carrie. The honorable member from Morale Donna and the government house leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the uh, Minister of Health and Wellness that this house adjourn until. April 1st, right around 10 o'clock in the morning, Mr. Speaker. Sean Carey. Yeah.